I call this meeting to order at 6.32. So before beginning, just want to welcome our new superintendent, Dr. Daly, to his first school committee meeting. So. How's, how's, how's the first few days been? So everything's going uh, wonderful. People have been so nice and kind. And uh, we got a nice uh, basket of cookies from John Bernard today for the office <laughs> to, to kind of thank us and wish us well. No, everyone uh, from, from the parents to the students to the, the teachers, everyone has just been so welcome and receptive. And uh, it's, it's been great, I really have to say. And I, I was worried about the snow days. And then I think John called in a favor and turned up the heat to 60 degrees this weekend. So it's been, <laughs> it's been good. So, no. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Well, welcome. Thank you. Okay, so we'll begin with public input. I see people here, but I'm guessing they're all for another presentation. There's nothing in the public, so we move on to the student report. So we have Julia Thorstad here, class of 2021. So for academic matters, students are preparing for mid-year exams next week, starting with a full day of school on Tuesday, followed by half days through the rest of the week. The quarter also ends that Friday, so students are finishing assessments and catching up on any work due. On top of that, seniors are finishing college applications with regular decision deadlines for January 15th. The high school held their open house for middle school students and parents, introducing them to many aspects of the high school, including the one-to-one -one program, the school's facilities, tables showcasing extracurricular clubs, activities, and sports, among other topics of discussion. Voter registration was available to students on Main Street in about 30 pre-registered. There will be an upcoming Chromebook check for all grades. And the student body recently saw a presentation by motivational speaker and singer Jesse Funk. For athletic matters, girls basketball is starting off well with new head coach Bob Romeo at four and three. Track had athletes competing at the Winter Classic this weekend with events spread over Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They will compete at state, state, rel state relays this week. Senior Sammy Marisolo reached 100 points as girls hockey captain from combined goals and assists. Wow. Senior Alex Vercolin was recently named in the Boston Globe's Players of the Week article for hat tricks and two consecutive victories. And Brian McAuliffe starts his first season as the head coach for his boys hockey team. Senior wrestler Stuart Glover gained his 100th career victory with the wrestling team at the Super Quad meet that North Reading hosted on Saturday. For fine arts matters, Notorious will be performing at an a cappella show in Wakefield. Maskers has announced their one act play for Drama Fest, which will be the Imaginary Invalid, which they start holding auditions for tomorrow. The middle school theater program will be using the pack for the Rock of Ages at the end of January. And for extracurricular matters, Student Council, for the first time, sent our own unified team of students to the Special Olympics bocce tournament. And the Student Council officers, including myself, will be having lunch with Dr. Daly tomorrow in Power Block to welcome him to the school and get to know some members of the student body. Model UN is leaving for their conference at Harvard at the end of the month. Adventure Club returned from their ski trip at Loon, where they enjoyed a weekend of warm weather skiing. Senior class officers are selling tickets for the freshman sophomore semi-formal dance, which will be on March 6th. North Reading Robotics placed fourth at their state qualifiers, and many clubs are fundraising with restaurant nights. And for my student work, um, I brought a piece um, from World History that was following our unit on Stalinism, where we pick a fic fictional character and show how they demonstrate the characteristics of a totalitarian leader. And so for ours, we chose Bowser from the Mario universe. <laughs> so we had a, um, a whole like life-size poster, but um, we donated that like to the class to be used like as an example. But this was um, what a friend of mine worked on in our group and it was really good. And um, it also included an essay that the group collaborated on describing how um, they fit the characteristics of a totalitarian leader. Interesting. Thank you very much. Comments, questions? Oh, just strange question. So how was the skiing? Did anyone say it was slushy or that they were like skiing in shorts or anything? It was so warm this weekend. Yeah, um, I didn't go on it, but a friend of mine said that they were like very, that they got kind of, you know, sweaty because I guess they weren't maybe prepared for the spring skiing, but it seemed like it was a very fun trip. Uh, Mr. Kleiger is here to be Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow, yeah. Oh, 
Oh, gee. <laughs> Very abnormal uh, weather, weather patterns there. But uh, no, the skiing on Saturday was great. Uh, Sunday was a little bit, uh, had some rain, it was a bit icy, but the lack of lines uh, at the lift, I think, made up for the conditions. So it was, uh, it was actually ended up, everyone uh, had a great attitude, teams were really flexible, and, uh, and no injuries, which is always a plus. So That's a plus. Very great. good. Excellent. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Julia. Okay. <coughs> you can probably get that from okay. <coughs> Dr. Dave. All right. Thank you. Yes. So we have no continued business, so we'll go to new business. And before we get to the high school, I think we have some special guests here from the Savings Bank. I'm guessing in the back, maybe. If you guys have, if Mr. Uh, so, so just so every, everyone knows, at the last meeting, <coughs> it was announced that the Savings Bank is going to help to support a new scoreboard at the softball field, or is it the, is it the softball field? Yeah, the softball field. And they've been trying to raise money for a while, and they stepped up with a very large donation contribution to do that. And so we asked that they please be invited to come here just so that we could thank them for it. Um, I think it's, it's wonderful when the community works together. And I know, I know the Savings Bank's a big piece of this community. And you know, a lot of restaurants, we don't have a lot of businesses in North Reading, but the few that we have have been very, very generous to the schools and to the town, and so we just really appreciate everything that you guys have done. And so, if anybody else had any other comments, or <coughs> you want to take a photo and thank them, or yes, yeah, so if you guys want to come down, we'll just kind of get a photo to thank you guys. <coughs> so, I don't think, did you bring a large check or anything? I would have had I done, but I brought a real check. A real check? This one can actually be cash, so. Inside the game. Yeah, we're we'll going inside the photo. <laughs> so this is for both hands. Baseball yes, with baseball and softball. Oh, it's baseball and softball. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, thank you again. I, I you want to put another one like that? No, just a chest. You can put a scoreboard up in the home. <laughs> I, you know, hey. Make some one of the kids says something witty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so do you just need to vote to accept? Do we need to accept a vote? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. Sure We're going to take a quick vote to accept the check. So if anybody is opposed to accepting $10,000. Well, I, uh, I, I will move to uh, <laughs> accept the gracious donation from the savings bank for $10,000 for the scoreboard. Second. OK, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. OK, thank you. <coughs> now moving on to the high school presentation. And so I think Mr. LaPrat would like to come up and <laughs> PowerPoints, or do we have? Yeah, we have. A, we do have a slide uh, presentation. Oh. Um, we have a, a number of presenters here, so you're certainly welcome to move into kind of the audience okay. side. If you would, can we make sure to give him, Michael, or somebody give him a microphone for? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> All right. So happy to uh, present this evening um, a bit of uh, you know, a sense of the number of things that are happening at the high school, highlighting uh, three tonight specifically around the idea of a more personalized approach to learning. You might recall um, last year at this time, we really talked about the student at the center, and that was uh, kind of complementing our present work at the time with the um, research collaboration for uh, relational coordination, which was um, some, uh, some support for, uh, from that group with respect to uh, our goals around personalized learning. And uh, that was associated with our uh, connection with the Maple organization. So tonight's program is really kind of three different aspects of that, a more personalized approach. Um, as a quick uh, 
sense of who's here. We have uh, Ms. Kerrigan and Mr. Falanga, fresh off the mountain, Mr. Falanga. Uh, Mr. Nosey, um, as the freshman advisory coordinator, and Mr. Ledoux here uh, to speak about how that's translating into physics. I'm gonna let them present, uh, obviously, um, when we get there. I did wanna start, though, with a little bit of a background around personalized learning. I'm sure this is something that um, is very much kind of on your mind around the number of schools that uh, are kind of focused along across this in the, in the district. But it really is more about the how than the what, I think, in, in uh, providing uh, the best learning opportunity for students. It focuses on these kind of uh, six realms, learner profiles, personal connections, competency-based progression, technology, personal learning paths, and flexible learning environments. And as we look at, at these different categories, we look at the high school, the new facility, obviously we're in our sixth year here at the high school, but with our new one-to-one -one across all grades, with our flexible learning spaces and the, the breakout areas, uh, with a lot of work that's been done in the curriculum around competency-based progression and things like that, we're, we're uh, you know, looking to, to cover all of these uh, specific areas. Tonight's program may, might focus a little bit more on kind of learner profiles, and you get that from Mr. Um, from Mr. Nosey's presentation with direct uh, reference to our freshman advisory program, but also, um, you know, as you'll see from the different presenters, uh, a number of these will, you know, are, are, are kind of flowering at the high school at a deeper level. So the uh, definition that you have up here is kind of color coded. So um, I'm not going to read it to you, but the, certainly the whole slideshow will be on the high school website. So everyone has, a, has access to that. But again, within the specific of the how, it's more of a philosophy than a what does it look like. It might look differently at different schools. Um, and that's part of that. Uh, philosophy of personalized learning. And this is the definition that we agreed upon as a faculty at the high school. This is really the maple definition that we've adopted that really started, again, uh, more uh, uh, at a deeper level last year with our work with the team from relational coordination. So our first uh, presentation tonight is Ms. Kerrigan and Mr. Falanga, empowering educators through UDL. They are our um, UDL coaches at the high school. So I'm gonna turn it over to them. Uh, good evening, hi, I am Mr. Falanga, uh, along with me presenting tonight. Shelly Kerrigan, Ms. hi. Kerrigan. <laughs> Um, so we are the UDL coaches for the high school, um, and how this started out is, um, well I guess taking a step back, UDL, um, so UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning. Uh, it is kind of one of these, I guess, uh, hot topic items along with personalized learning and a lot of other things in education. Um, and so Universal Design for Learning is, is just that, it actually it, it has its roots in, um, in architectural and building um, area. Uh, field, I suppose, um, and so it's a way of, it's a guiding set of principles um, that help make uh, the curriculum uh, accessible to all students. So uh, with that, you know, if you can take, you picture, um, you know, a building being built um, and think about, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe a, a staircase versus a ramp, okay? So staircase, um, most people can use a staircase but there may be somebody who has a disability or is in a wheelchair. There's something that will prevent them from being able to use those stairs. Then you think about maybe uh, a ramp and everyone being able to use that ramp. So people with and without disabilities. So, um, so in, in, in that kind of context, you know, the ramp is more accessible for everyone. So, um, so universal design for learning, kind of similar. Is it's, is it's a, a, a way to um, make the curriculum accessible to all students. Um, so Shelly and I started, uh, Ms. Kerrigan and I started in 2018, 2019 as UDL coaches for the high school. Uh, the, um, the district is involved, was involved with this uh, radar grant that was uh, provided by the state. Um, so there are two uh, coaches from each school throughout the district. Um, Shelly and I are the coaches for the high school. Um, it's pretty teacher uh, driven, teacher led. Um, um, initiative, I guess, to kind of get uh, more teachers involved 
uh, with uh, implementing uni universal uh, design for learning strategies into their classrooms. Uh, we started uh, in the 18-19 school year with 10 teachers who volunteered to participate from five different departments in the building. Uh, focused primarily on the principles of UDL, trying to just introduce the concepts to teachers and then get them to incorporate it in their classes uh, as they were able to do that. Um, structuring their lessons through a UDL lens. Um, which lots of times we'll just provide options for students in what their or how they choose to express their um, their understanding. Um, shared some ideas, questions. We did some classroom observations with each other. Uh, we worked with a, a UDL coach through Seam Collaborative. Uh, collaborative. Her name is Emily Pat. Uh, very knowledgeable uh, a woman who is. Uh, we are fortunate to have working with us again this year. Shelly will touch a little bit more on that. Um, but she primarily came into the school year later in the year. Uh, I believe it was in, uh, in May to do some observations, meet with the teachers who were participating, and uh, be able to give them a little bit of feedback. Last year, uh, uh, several of the teachers created lesson plans um, for those observations that implemented various UDL strategies. So um, I'm going to hand it over now to Ms. Kerrigan. She can kind of talk about where we are right now. Yeah, so this year, um, Andrew and I were lucky enough to be able to continue with the coaching position. Um, so we have 27 teachers who have now um, jumped on board from six departments. So that's pretty awesome that we almost tripled the number of participants. Um, and this year we're focusing on, because after we worked with Emily, we felt like teachers were doing a pretty good idea, um, job with the um, representation piece. So letting, kind of giving options for how students learn information and then also the expression piece, how they show what they've learned. Um, so we're focusing more on the engagement part, like why are we learning it, which is um, the trickiest part to do. So that's our focus for this year. Um, we started by recording a lesson of us teaching, just individually, and we watched it and kind of did some self-assessment, which if you haven't filmed yourself doing your job, it's really um, awkward. And, <laughs> but it's a good way to reflect um, something that I had to do when I was student teaching, but that was a really long time ago. Um, and we kind of use that as our starting point and we will record again later on, like late winter, early spring, to hopefully see some growth there. Um, we're also, Andrew and I have been reading the book, Engage the Brain, um, as our part of our role as coaches. Um, because all the UDL stuff is really brain-based um, and it's based on actual science and data. So we're reading that to kind of help us understand what's going on so we can help the teachers we're working with. Um, so like last year, we're sharing ideas in our group. We have a monthly meeting. Um, we're working on developing this resource document, um, which is still in the See, it's, you know, it's a living document, so it's being developed, but the idea is that eventually with kind of resources, et cetera, um, that eventually we get to the point where we can share this out with the entire faculty in May. Um, so we take what these 27 teachers have been doing to the entire, um, all 70, however many of us there are. Um, and we're meeting with Emily after school on Wednesday, and then she'll be coming in. We didn't have her, we didn't schedule any time for her to do observations this week while she's in the district because, um, as Julia said earlier, it's end of quarter testing and review for mid year exams. But she'll be coming in in March and May to do some observations and feedback. Um, and I have a couple of students here uh, with me. So these are some examples of some of the products that I've gotten from my ninth grade biology classes. Um, so I was, th and this is something that as teachers, we do all this UDL stuff kind of behind the scenes. But when Mr. Flanga and I were meeting with Emily last week, she was like, tell the students about it. Like it's for them. Um, so I kind of started to tell as I was trying to re desperately to recruit students to come in tonight <laughs> and talk. I was like, so guys, we've been doing this UDL stuff. And so I was telling them a little bit. And then Angelina and Annalise, who are here, I'll have, you guys can come on up. Um, I was telling them a little bit more, which I'm gonna be sharing with the 
um, ninth graders after mid-year exams, one thing at a time. But like really the goal of UDL is to get the students to become expert learners. Um, so they are kind of in charge of their own learning um, and really taking ownership for it. So Angelina Palazzolo and Annalise Butler are in my honors biology class and they are, they're just gonna tell you a little bit about some of the UDL stuff they've been doing in bio and other classes. <laughs> My examples are just centered around projects and assignments that we've had. So um, in biology, all the projects we have, we can do, you know, a poem or a video or just anything like that. Um, and it really just helps students, including myself, to express themselves and um, makes them feel like they're not, you know, forced to one area in the project, they can really just be comfortable with what they're learning and presenting. Another example is um, in my health class, let's see. Um, where was that? Oh, well, okay, so in history, <laughs> for uh, the tests, we can have, we have the study guide and then we can have there's multiple choices for short answers that we can choose from. So we can really just prepare and um, there's multiple, multiple aspects that we're learning, but we can really just focus on one. And um, another example is also in health. We're also doing a project on mental disorders. So today we got to choose one that we really wanna focus on like OCD, schizophrenia, things like that. Um, it can just really help the student feel like comfortable. Um, it's also a lot less stress on the student. And I feel like it's um, like having the same options as all the other students can make them feel like the subject doesn't matter as much or isn't as significant but as um, compared to if you have your own unique assignment, um, you can feel like you really are putting in the work for a reason. And overall, there's just a really better outcome. Um, also, having multiple options gives you a fair choice to show what you really know. And you can be overall just like really proud of your work. Um, some examples I've had were um, in my US history class, he gave us several different prompts that has to do with um, modern issues in the world, and we got to research the, pro um, the topic that we got to choose and write an essay within a group and collaborate on it. And I felt that um, it really felt personalized so I could learn about things that I was interested in and stuff that I felt like affected me. And um, I feel like getting to choose the way you present your um, knowledge is really important because um, depending on like the way you learn, it's the same kind of thing where it's the same where um, <laughs> you could present your knowledge in different ways. So some people might not be good at test taking, so it might be easier for them to make a project or um, do something funner to, um, to present what they learned in their class. Um, me and Annalise are in a lot of the same classes, so we have a lot of the same opportunities for different um, for different opportunities like that. And I feel like it's a lot, um, <laughs> it's a lot more beneficial for the student to get to choose which path they're taking, just generally. Great. Nice shot, guys. Wait. I have a couple questions. So first of all, thank you guys for coming and thank you for volunteering to come and speak before us tonight. I know that it's not, yeah, I, I mean, I'm surprised people don't want to come talk to us, but you know, it's I know I know it takes a lot, so thank you for that. Um, so I have a couple questions. First one is, when you guys do all these projects, you're obviously working in groups sometimes, but it seems interesting. Do a lot of these get presented so everybody can see what's being done, or is this just all turned in and the teachers see them? Like I don't know how this works. Like, do you guys ever present to the class so that everybody can see the projects that everybody else worked on? I mean, some of them, it's really the teacher's choice. Like, I know in biology, you get to choose. Like, we did a rap, like a video for our project. Um, and 
we're going to choose to present that because we just want to show our hard work. But then, you know, in others, obviously, it's better for just the teacher, teacher's view only. So okay. it really just depends on the teacher, I guess. Yeah, it like depends on, like, what the content is. Because it's, if it's, like, an essay, yeah. I don't know if the students really want to, like, read that. <laughs> people's essays. <laughs> Because I mean, I, I wouldn't even think to do some of the ideas that people are doing, like a rap, or any, I mean, it would just be something I wouldn't even think about. And since I, I mean, I think they mentioned earlier the UDL is really like a newer, like trendier idea. I mean, have you seen a big? I mean, you guys are you know in high school now. I mean, have you seen a big change since you were you know elementary or middle school? Have you seen that? I mean, a big change where did it was it used to? Did it used to be mainly like book reports and essays, and now you see this more often, or is this? You know, or has it been this way for years? I feel like I see the choices more often. There were opportunities to make different types of things in the past, but it was normally like you only get one option. But now I feel like I do have a lot more options in what I'm presenting. And I also feel like students just, in general, just went to the most common um, way to present what they know instead of just branching out. So in high school, it really gives you that ability to like branch out and express yourself with whatever you want to present and um, present on something you're more educated on. That's great. I, I would just do an essay, and I'm not creative enough. So I, 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 I appreciate the talent to do any of these. So thank you. Anybody else have questions or comments? Oh, that was good. Huh? OK. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, excellent job. The early days was better than the newest stuff, but I'm just kidding. Um, Mr. Nosey, speaking about, so if you recall back on that original slide about um, the learner profile and that uh, as our presentation and that young lady, Annalise, I mean, Angelina just spoke about kind of how can we maximize that um, within the model that we have here at the high school without giving the impression to, to namely students and faculty, like, we're doing something else. Um, and we're, we think it's going to work, but we're not sure. We feel like, you know, uh, with Mr. Nosey, certainly as our freshman advisory coordinator, the, the framework for this type of thing already exists. And how are we leveraging it in the best way we can? And that's what Mr. Nosey is going to talk about uh, next around the personalizing freshman advisor. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, before I get started on this, I'm one of the teachers in the UDL program. I've done it for the past two years, and it's been um, it's one of the best things I've done. And I've been designing and redesigning a lot of my lessons in my English, room, my English classroom, and it's been really great. Um, but as far as freshman advisory is concerned, um, every freshman, so we just lost our two, um, but every freshman at the high school is placed in an advisory power block. So during their power block, they go to a specific teacher every day um, during that time period. and we sort of have four main goals while they're in that, <clears throat> in that advisory block. Um, first one is to help them to transition to high school and then onto their sophomore year. So we focus on the transition to high school earlier on. And then um, later this spring, we'll get into the transition to sophomore year, talking about choosing classes and things like that. Um, it helps them to establish an adult connection in the building, um, whether that's their power block advisor or it helps them sort of realize they have a coach or they have their, you know, their math teacher or something like that. Um, one of our big projects in the freshman advisory is developing and tracking their progress on goals and then also identifying and logging their interests and strengths to help personalize their learning experience. So um, the two young ladies here, they're talking about the projects they chose. This is an opportunity for them to realize, oh, I'm really good at, you know, making dioramas. I'll do that when I do my project. I'm really good at writing uh, a creative piece of writing. This is what I'm going to work on. And um, that's one of those, one of the goals, one of the, um, the things we focus on in the freshman advisory. So the first um, thing I want to talk about is that transition to high school. So the advisors have their large group meetings when they have you know, their 20 or so kids in the power block. Um, and this happens every few weeks. They sort of make sure everyone's in there. Uh, we'll have an announcement, say, make sure you're in your power block. Don't you know, go make up a test. or. Um, go to like lunch with a scientist, whatever else is going on. Um, and then additionally, they have individual meetings where they'll meet with students sort of one-on-one -on -one during probably a couple power blocks out of the, uh, the time they have. 
So in the fall and spring, it's all about their transitions, so either to high school or to their sophomore year. Things that we've looked at so far are looking at, um, excuse me, navigating and being a student at the high school, choosing their classes, that's coming up. Our program of studies obviously will be out soon. Um, and identifying their strengths, as I mentioned earlier, to prepare for a successful and fulfilling high school career. So realize what they're good at and what they like, um, so they can sort of figure out where they want to go with their, their time here and even beyond. Um, the other goal, or another goal, is helping students to find um, another adult connection in the building. So we have our meetings where they develop goals and they identify an adult who can help them reach them. So one of the first things we did is we had um, a survey sent out to all the freshmen. They filled out, you know, I have goals, I work on goals, here's someone that can help me with it. And uh, we had a really good response rate with that. And then we're currently in the process of um, putting those goals onto Naviance, one of the, the programs they have access to. I've been working with um, Mr. Rosa in the guidance department on that. Um, another aspect of that adult connection is having an adult in the building um, who has access to their grades. So I no longer have a uh, freshman power block, but when I did, I was able to jump on there, and all power block teachers can do this, I think, um, jump on and say, oh, hey, you know, you're doing really well in science, or hey, you're having a hard time in math. Maybe you should go see your math teacher during power block today. Um, and we have those periodic check-ins related to that. Um, there's also an element of consistency, which I think is important. They're in the same place at the same time, and it's every day. It's not you know, a green or gold situation. It's every single day. And they're with the same adult, which um, I think is important to foster that connection. They see someone you know, theoretically 180 times a year. Um, the big thing we started with, as I mentioned, is their goal setting. So we had them develop short and long-term SMART goals for school, um, extracurricular activities, and their post-high school life. So six total, so a short-term and long-term for each of those. Um, and they track those through Naviance. We're going to set that up. They're done on paper right now. We're going to push that onto the computer um, after midterms. And then they can track and log that, process, that progress alongside their advisor um, in reaching that goal. And something we came up with earlier on in the year with that survey is that 90% of the students in the freshman class said they discuss their goals with an adult in the building, whether that's their power block teacher or a subject teacher, a coach, an advisor, um, guidance counselor, or somebody. Which that was pretty great that all those students are, are working on that. And then the ultimate goal of all of this is helping the kids personalize their learning. That's part of that UDL piece that um, Andrew and Shelley mentioned. And our thought is that by understanding their interests, strengths, and goals, they can chart a course in their high school career um, that is fulfilling and successful. Are there any questions about the advisory? Rich, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're starting like right right off the bat talking to the students, which of course is really good. Are you are, are you bring, bringing any information from middle school uh, as part of that, or, or are you basically starting with a kind of clean slate um, with each student? The um, the middle school piece they, that they're providing that I guess the the students on their own like okay. this is what I you know folks on middle school okay. that's that's the main source of information for that. This is really the second year that we've been focused on the Naviance goals piece. Right, which so, you know, it's, it's developing, but I think that's something that they bring to the table on their own, knowing their past experiences. So, I have a couple questions. I mean, the first one is, so now that the middle and high school is, are combined, do you feel like the transition's any, any easier, or is it the same as it was before? Do I think the, the, the physical transition's easy. They know where the building is. They know, you know, they know where the cafeteria is. They know that sort of stuff that like the logistical things that might stress a freshman out. But I think as far as switching to our schedule and different teachers, different expectations, seeing you know a senior in the, in the hallway when you're just where the oldest kid, now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think that stuff still exists in the building. Um, just that, you know, understanding what it's like to be in high school as opposed to being, you know, across the, the bridge. And, and I think, I mean, I, I just, again, I was in high school a long time ago now, but it seems like, I felt like in my my school, it just seemed like when once you got to high school, it was more like this is real. This counts for college. This counts for things like you know sixth, seventh grade was nice, but you know once you get to ninth grade, everything is counting. And so, is there a lot more stress? Do you, do you feel like freshman year is really the year that a lot of that begins? That there's more pressure on it? Yeah, looking at their goals, they definitely have their goals are much more focused on I want to do this when I'm older, and now this is my time to make sure I'm doing that. 
I mean, you guys are upperclassmen, right? You know that this is like your time to, to be, you know, I want to do this when I'm older. I need to buckle down and make sure I'm doing a good job here. And that's, we help them recognize that in that um, advisory. But I think it's also, we help them try to find a balance. One of the things we're doing outside of the things I mentioned here is alongside the library, we have a reading challenge. So every power block, every freshman power block, they're tracking um, how much outside reading they're doing. And um, whichever power block gets the, the most hours, they're using an app, I cannot remember the name of the app. Um, whichever power block gets the most hours um, logged, they get a pizza party um, from the library. Um, so it's, it's a balance, I think, of, you know, I want to go to this college and study this, but also here's a way I can, you know, relieve some stress and read a book that's not assigned to me. And, and do you see a lot of uh, students supporting each other? Or is it mo mostly looking for the support of the advisor? Or is there a lot of support amongst the colleague, the, the students as well? I think so. One of the things we're working on right now is having them um, identify who can support them. So. Um, I think in general they tend to look to an adult, at least as a freshman, and then um, one of the things we've talked about, so I think there's um, nine advisors and myself, so when we talk, we have our meetings, we've been talking about, okay, how can we help them identify who can help them? And it's, it's not just the person, so okay, you want to get better at, you know, hitting the opposite field. It doesn't have to be just your baseball coach, it can be, you know, someone on the team that's good at that. So helping them figure out who can help them, whether it's an adult or a, another kid. I think that the, the other nice piece about this is that there's that obvious kind of self-reflection, self-assessment that the student is doing. But then in documenting that, oh. and then the teacher access, once we get that loaded into Naviance, and now uh, on the teacher side, again, to help with this personalization, to say, well, I see you're good at these things. In fact, in this class, there's two other students that are interested in this. This might be a nice opportunity to collaborate. So it, it really is a you know kind of a, a two-way uh, opportunity for that information um, and we're really we're really hoping that uh, it's you know that the upside um, is really quite dramatic because I think again it, it, it's allowing students to go through that process to think about you know gee next time I'm in this situation I know what I can say I know what uh, I don't have to think like, well I'll just do this or, or I can look at my goals or what are they, this will really help or here's a real interest factor that I have and mm -hmm. I know this other student has the same interest so uh, you know, we're, we're excited about this model. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So now we're going to, uh, thank you. So now we're going to um, kind of bring it in uh, for our next presenter, Mr. Ledoux, who's got uh, some of his uh, physics students with him tonight. Um, so again, we, we kind of had a, an overall uh, curriculum approach with our presentation of UDL as, a, as an idea under that umbrella of personalized learning. And now how we're kind of building that at the freshman level with our advisory program, and now extending it directly you know, into the classroom, specifically with physics. <laughs> Mr. Ledoux. Thank you, AJ. <laughs> um, so what I'll run through this evening, uh, we'll introduce everyone here. Um, I'll talk about uh, some physics education research that's ongoing right now, um, and what's going on in that. Uh, I'll talk about how I'm incorporating physics education research into our classroom with the use of practicals. And I'll finish with um, an interesting professional development opportunity that I got to experience over the summer. So uh, again, my name's Tom. Uh, this is my sixth year of teaching and my second year in North Reading. Um, and I have been teaching students physics for six years. So I think that's important that we remember that we are teaching students subjects and that we're not just this you know wealth of knowledge and that we're teaching students stuff um, and with me this evening I have uh, my name is Brennan Witz Ian Miller um, Natalie Gonthier thank you so um, the bread and butter of any physics course, uh, if you've taken one, was probably the end of chapter textbook problems and whether they were in a textbook or whether the teacher copied them out of the textbook and gave them to you, they're the bread and butter. They're the, you know, someone swings from the end of a rope and how high does the rope go or how far does the block slide or, you know, how many different ways can this ball roll down a ramp and what does it really mean? Um, but in 2002, Kim and Pack did a study that showed 
correlation between the number of textbook problems solved and conceptual understanding. So they surveyed about 30 students in a class um, who were going on to college. Uh, this was done in Korea, where students typically um, ha have to take an entrance exam in order to uh, get into a study a science in college. And students complete upwards of 3,000 textbook problems before taking a standardized test. And there was no correlation between the number of problems they solved out of the textbook and their conceptual understanding of a topic. So sure, they could solve a problem, but when asked a question that wasn't numbers-based and wasn't a high-level thinking math problem, but was a physics question, there was no correlation between whether a student could get it right and how many problems they solved. So to continue with that, um, we've talked about how we can show multiple contexts and how we can do multiple different things in class that will allow students to better visualize and hopefully gain that conceptual understanding. Um, and the way that we do that in science classes is through laboratory experiences. Um, one of the things that really helps us students kind of learn and grasp the knowledge is uh, practicums, which are essentially labs is the better name for them. Um, it's one thing to get a problem, you know, Joe pushes a car, how fast does it go when it's, when it's stopped, whatever. Those aren't, those don't help students like me learn. Those are, you get the answer, you get a check, you go to lunch. That's the end of it. When you can physically see that, it gets you motivated to learn. When you do all the math out, when you make all the calculations, and what you do actually worked, that's something totally different than getting an answer and being told, oh yeah, that's gonna happen. It's a whole new realm. It gets students excited about learning. And when students are excited, guess what they do? They want to learn more. So it's a whole nother realm if you can get a student excited and motivated and get that fire in them to learn. So we have two demonstrations here of a practicum that we did to calculate how high to drop a spring with a mass on it to try not to crack the egg. So with this one, that's obviously a failed, failed experiment. That one needs a redo. Something got messed up. But after adjustment, after uh, looking back at your work, making some few tweaks, so obviously the aim's not 100%, but if it was on target, the egg would have still survived. So it's little labs like this that, in my opinion, really make physics something exciting, something palatable, and something that students like us really love. Um, I think another good thing that I find helpful with the labs and the practicums is that it takes these weird, abstract, and complicated concepts and formulas that we learn in class, and it applies it to a real-world thing. And it's a great way of helping us understand these concepts of, as opposed to just looking at a textbook or a formula or something. It's, it's kind of tough to picture in your head and being able to kind of lay everything out and combining everything that we know into something that can you know, take shape in these labs, whatever they are, is really helpful for that. So the thing I find most helpful about these labs is that you're familiar with seeing like how to set something up. So when it comes time for the AP exam, although you don't want to focus on like the big aspect of the AP exam, you want to focus on the learning more. If you're more familiar with like, oh, say this FRQ says, okay, we're giving you like all of these materials and we want you to find these variables. You're familiar with how to like set up something in order to get those variables. And then you know from experience that if you do it a certain way, then you can get those variables. Thank you, guys. Um, next up, I just have two, two more pictures of two lab practicals. So when we started with um, Newton's laws and, um, uh, and static equilibrium, uh, this is a traditional textbook problem where you have two hanging masses, one mass here and one mass here. Uh, and based on the angle 
that it makes here with this pulley, and there's a pulley over here, you can determine the mass of this block. And it's a pretty standard intro level textbook problem when, we, when you begin Newton's laws for static equilibrium. Instead of giving them that problem, we can set up this experiment where students can diagram out this picture. All they were allowed to use was a ruler. And they were able to measure angles using a ruler and accurately predict the mass of that hanging number seven block. So very visual. And at the end of it, they get a result. They have to physically remove the block from this setup, bring it over to a scale, and put it on. And they know if they're right or if they're wrong. So um, that, has, that concludes my lab practical portion of it. I just quickly want to talk about this really interesting professional development opportunity I had over the summer because I think uh, not many people know about it, and I think it's really worth showing. So uh, I was able to find a physics professional development over the summer. Um, if you don't know, those are hard to find and hard to come by. Uh, and uh, it was a way to incorporate modern physics into um, our high school curriculum. Uh, and where I ended up was I ended up in Washington State. And I ended up on the eastern part, the desert side. I did not go to Seattle. Um, and there, there is a lab called the Laser Infratometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or as I'll refer to it for the rest of the evening, LIGO. And it was designed um, as a way to detect gravitational waves. Um, what a gravitational wave is, is when two large objects in space are making the end of their journey and collide. They warp the space-time around them, and they cause ripples in the space-time around them. Those ripples are sent through the gap through the universe and through space. And eventually, they reach Earth. And when they reach Earth, they warp and bend and stretch and compress Earth. Not to any noticeable but amount, but it actually happens. And they're testing them out here at LIGO. The really interesting thing I thought when I first started reading about these was that gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein in 1915. Mathematically, they could exist, sure. Einstein said we'd never be able to find them in 1915. And 100 years later, on September 14, 2015, in Hannaford, Washington, the first gravitational wave was recorded and observed. Two supermassive black holes collided um, many millions of years ago and their, their gravitational waves reached Earth and passed through LIGO's detector. And that's where I was. Those arms are four kilometers long, and they can measure up to 10 to the minus 18 meter changes in them. So when they get longer and shorter, those arms can detect it. So this is awesome. How do I bring it into the classroom, right? So, what we have to do first is we teach students that gravity is not this thing that makes apples fall on people's heads, and that gravity warps the space around us. So we think of sp space as a bed sheet, and when we put something on the bed sheet, it bends the space time. And how a gravitational wave, when two things coming together to merge, cause great ripples in, these, in this space time. Um, we can demonstrate that, and we demonstrate how LIGO and this detector are able to find those ripples and detect those ripples. There are my references. Um, I'm happy to share with you through my membership uh, with the American Association of Physics Teachers those if you're interested in reading them. Um, uh, do you have any questions? Well, I'll, I'll make a couple comments first. I mean, we clearly have very different ideas for summer plans. <laughs> I would say uh, it, it, it is very nice and refreshing to see teachers that are so invested in what they do. And so, like, I mean, I think your passion for, the, for what you're doing comes out in this. And so I think that's great. Um, Thank you. Yeah, in, ter in terms of, I, mean, I, think, I, like, I think there's consistency overall with what we've been hearing for the last couple of years here when you're talking about how we're trying to how we're trying to learn things like every time we go to the elementary schools and they 
everything's about doing something hands-on and, and it just seems like the learning is better when you do things hands-on and so I mean my, my, I guess my only question is like I mean do you do you see the correlation then do, I mean do you feel like on testing because the testing is obviously not lab-based usually correct I mean or do you do lab-based testing as well um, so a, like a physical lab as an exam would be a no, okay. but um, in keeping with the nature of the course and how there is an exam at the end of it, one of the three free responses giving, given on the AP exam will be a data or lab-based experiment. So stu students do know, need to know how to design an experiment, collect data from the experiment, and analyze the data. Okay, and, 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 do you, and are there a lot of studies that show that by, I think that's kind of what you pointed to before, but where you know, like when, when you do the labs, I mean, eventually do test scores and like the, the results go up. I mean, is it just for that or is it also like, I, I would imagine also the other advantage is you learn it and you remember it beyond just the test because like there's a lot of things that I remember that I could remember for the test on Friday, but I might not remember beyond that. But is there a correlation with long-term understanding and learning beyond just the test? I haven't read um, anything about that yet. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the middle bullet there with yeah. Kim and Pack and how they showed yeah. little correlation exists between solving textbook problems. Um, the piece that I left out of this presentation was what goes on during um, intro physics, which happens during the junior year, where we follow a modeling instruction um, curriculum. Modeling instruction is where instead of starting out a topic by it giving some key vocabulary, key terms, um, you start them off with a question in a lab and they, from the, and they develop a model on their own. It doesn't even necessarily need to be the way that it looks in the textbook. You know, students could determine that speed is seconds per meter and not meters per second, but they're designing the experiment and they're coming up with it on their own. So the in better part of intro physics in the 11th grade, and for some it's the 12th grade when they take it for the first time, is spent designing experiments and coming up with these ideas. Um, instead of teaching them as Newton's laws, we teach them as the model of for, for forces. We talk about the balanced force model, the unbalanced force model. We talk about the energy model and how a pendulum swings back and forth is a model. And it's mathematically modeled but before it was mathematically designed, it was done. So we try for more visual representation first, and then the math comes second. Um, we'd have to look at numbers to see how many students are taking physics and seeing how that has improved. Good. Any other comments, questions? Well, thank you. And to the students again, thank you for coming out. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Uh, I'm going to kind of get us back to LIGO. Thank you. All right. Um, so that kind of concludes the uh, kind of the high school presentation portion. Um, and again, I just to kind of quickly wrap that up, that idea of um, looking at a more personalized experience, starting with uh, the teachers, starting with the faculty, getting them on board. We can see the growth in that UDL model. Looking at the freshmen, saying how can we start to build these profiles, get kids confident in goal setting, confident in their interests, and then start to support that through their freshman, sophomore, junior year, and then getting into, obviously, AP Physics C and you know, kind of using that as saying, hey, now we've got uh, a real opportunity to be an independent thinker, have, be really confident with the content, and start to um, really assess and analyze some really deep, uh, deep, deep material. So I hope uh, you enjoyed those three presentations. Um, if you're okay, we can transition now, if you would, if you're okay, with, to the four new courses that um, I'm hoping can make it into the course of study for uh, the 2020-2021 school year. Um, the, I'm assuming you have the packet that uh, included those courses in the course write-ups. I will introduce, uh, sorry, I will just uh, briefly uh, comment that when we look at new courses, there's a, there's a number of um, kind of 
quote unquote boxes that we want to make sure are checked when we do this. One is that the course material is relevant, uh, that it is interesting and has uh, you know, uh, a basis for student interest. It is accessible to students. Um, and how do we maintain that accessibility for multiple levels, uh, you know, regardless of the content? That it is interconnected with other course materials. It's not a course that just kind of floats out um, you know, outside of the program of studies, but relates to the existing coursework and along a pathway uh, of study. And also that it's rigorous and uh, that it's going to challenge students. And, and additionally, it's always nice when our courses align specifically with the school committee's goals, too. Uh, so I think you'll see some of that as well. So these four courses, um, and I just kind of gave you the titles and the specifics around, around them. Um, and I'm happy to respond to questions. Again, um, this, this is information that is in your packet. Um, and hopeful, I'm hopeful that these courses would make it into the 2021 program of study. Rich? So I had a question, AJ. Um, what's the demand? What's the demand side of this? Uh, so what's where? Where is the uh, sort of request coming from, or the desire coming from? Sure, sure. So I will say there's, there's a there's a couple of a couple of uh, answers to that. We can start at the top. Um, one of the things that, that we have heard from students in the past is I would take more courses. Uh, I would take this course. If I have had a little flexibility, do we have semester long courses? Well, we really don't. We have year long courses. Right. So, Epics and Fairy Tales is um, a literature course that would serve as that kind of semester model. Uh, and as you, as you see in the uh, course description, half of that, so the course would be split. We'd really look for um, a large number of uh, course requests for this, somewhere in the, I'd say, 40 to 50 range. So that half of the students are in the epics side, half on the fairy tale side, and they'll swap at the um, at the semester break. Um, we are looking at doing a similar model right now with our uh, creative writing and our novel writing classes. Mm -hmm. Kind of trim the creative writing model down, trim the mo uh, the novel writing down, and see. I will say, novel writing has it run. We've always had a lot some interest in it. Never the numbers great enough to kind of really run it as a as a single class. And we're hoping that this, this uh, approach kind of gets that. Um, with respect to the advanced algebra with financial applications, I think that's, a, that's another course that we're looking for, for seniors to say, all right, I'm in, um, I'm in pre-calculus. Right. Do I really want to go to Calc Honors? Right. Do I really want to be in stats? Is there another option? Is there, is there a business option that's not statistics? Um, one of the, you know, one of the really, uh, I'll say, sausage making uh, pieces of this is meeting with uh, the curriculum leaders, meeting with the guidance department, following up with students, looking at um, college data and saying what courses are really uh, courses out there that, that um, have an end in mind that we maybe we don't have uh, accounted for. So that's, that, that advanced algebra I think is a really, we, Mr. Rosa and I did a number of, uh, did some data, and there are, there's greater than 80 students right now in uh, pre-calc academic, juniors in pre-calc academic. Right. So I'm in that class and I'm saying, where, 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 what are my choices? Where do I go next? Yeah. Do I really, is it calc honors? Oof, I don't know if I'm ready for that. All right, so I guess I'm gonna take statistics. Well, it really <laughs> doesn't match up with my major. So um, I think that's a course that really uh, we feel is going to kind of be in that business, my kind of business sweet spot um, that, uh, you know, is advanced algebra, not solely statistics, but, but may do a little, uh, a little of everything. Well, the eight, oh, I mean, I, I would just add to that. I mean, you're talking, it says in there college preparatory, but I just think overall life preparatory as well is important yeah. because <laughs> I mean, just basic, you know, sure. understanding investing, credit, you know, employment and income taxes. Like, I mean, I deal with a lot of young people at my work, and a lot of them don't have very basic knowledge about, you know, financial wherewithal, how to budget, things like that. And I understand that's not always what an advanced algebra class, class is going to be, but the more, more that it can apply to real life is, oh. is worthwhile as well. And, I mean, I know they do the, you know, they do a lot of, like, 
things here and there. They do that uh, that one, uh, what's it called, where they come in and they have community members affair that comes in oh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But again, from that, you see all the time that a lot of people don't get really basic, like, you know, a lot of people think if I pay off my mortgage, it's bad because I get, don't get a tax deduction. And it's like, well, but you're paying interest on that. And just understanding it, I think that's useful. So I like that, and I like the... Uh, and yeah, the, yeah. it feels like the uh, it goes in the other direction, too. The, the real-world applications bring the algebra... Uh, you know, to more meaning, more uh, brings it to life a little bit too. So that's the hope. Absolutely, works both ways. That's what we anticipate. Uh, on, on the other side, the uh, AP computer principles, computer uh, uh, science principles. This is a new, a fairly new uh, curriculum that the uh, AP, the College Board, is is rolling out. Um, the access point is. I would say uh, lower than the AP computer science. Um, it's more about. Uh, program um, program writing and analytics than let's say the uh, the computer science um, computer science a so uh, I worked closely with uh, dr. Downs on this one and kind of uh, you know I will I will tell you that one thing we are very mindful of at the high school is this idea of um, how AP courses shape student course uh, requests um, so we are, uh, at the leadership team level, we are uh, preparing a study uh, for the early winter, um, uh, mid-winter, early spring uh, to collect some data on this and, and, and kind of get a sense of where are we with our AP model. On our, uh, but we don't want to miss an opportunity to have a, uh, a computer science, to expand that computer science uh, program right now when we can. And Ms. Uh, Ms. Sanano and Ms. Yamas are in the back here in that um, they're going to be presenting uh, in a bit on another topic. But again, this uh, contemporary Hispanic culture course, uh, an elective that kind of supports that, that world languages instruction, but doesn't maybe compel a student to feel like they have to go into an area where they're not very comfortable, but they want to maybe broaden their, um, their experience with a language uh, across culture, a cultural understanding. So I think that'll be a, uh, a course that we'll see a lot of interest in as well. Hi. Thank I, you I very just much. have one more yeah, Rich. comment or question. So <clears throat> the, and maybe this is what you're talking about in terms of your, the work you're going to do later looking at the AP program, but do you see a conflict between what we've talked about in the early part of your presentation with the, with the with the personalized learning and the AP program, which is very has a very specific target uh, at, at, at the end. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't see a conflict. I think um, I will say, you know, having having been in this this role for a number of years now and watching students select courses, and I mean, there's there is certainly there's the there, there's the learning that comes in as a freshman that says, okay, boy, this is a great opportunity. I'm really not sure what I want to do. And there are those students that come through and say, I know exactly what I want. I, I, I have a very clear sense of what I want to be doing. Um, and I want, to, I want to really challenge myself. And I want to uh, you know, maximize the, the rigor that I, that I can. So I think to, to kind of uh, respond to your point, I think the, the, that personalized um, focus is, is not inhibited in any way by adding APs, but it's supported because, again, that student is, is um, with our open enrollment approach, I can take it or I can, I can I cannot take it. And I can try it and say, hey, uh, I didn't have to test into this class. I just want to see what that looks like. And that experience, you know, the kind of uh, all boats rise at high tide type of thing, um, I think it's a, I think it really buffets the, that personalized mm -hmm. model. Okay. So I think we need a motion and a vote on this one I, i'm assuming we can do all four together correct i think so i have a motion to accept will, the new course I proposals will, i will make the motion that we accept the new courses uh in as proposed in the handout um i was going to read them but i guess i don't need to the, the four in the handout okay second okay any more discussion all those in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed unanimous Excellent. thank you Mr. Thank you very much thank you very much okay. thank you <laughs> Moving along, uh, high school language immersion international travel. <clears throat> Do 
Did we come down too soon? We came down too soon. <laughs> to go back up. <laughs> back up. I'm going to make you guys sit in the front. Ah, we'll go. My name is Amy St. Arnaud, and I'm the Curriculum Coordinator for World Languages, and I'm here with Ana Yamas, who's one of our um, Spanish teachers, and she'll be leading the trip. We're just going to start off our presentation quickly. I'm going to talk about the, um, the ties this has to our curriculum, um, and then Ana will get into specifics about the trip that we're proposing. And the handout that I passed out is just a summary of the National World Language Standards, um, and that's just what I'm going to be referencing in my very brief um, presentation on the connection between the, the trip and our standards. Um, so here at North Reading High School, um, our world language program believes strongly in structuring activities that allow our future and current students to demonstrate real world applications of their cultural and language skills. And that's a theme that you've been hearing a lot tonight and we're going to jump on that bandwagon as well. That long past are the days that our kids are conjugating verbs and reading about things in the textbooks um, through the one to one initiative through just YouTube um, and other resources we have, um, we're able to give our kids more authentic opportunities to experience a language in the classroom, but we want to, to skip to the last paragraph, we feel our program is incomplete just doing those sorts of things in the classroom. We want to make sure our kids get out into the community, whether it's here in North Reading or it's in um, you know the greater Boston area, but also experience um, diverse cultures through an immersion program. Um, and that's what we're hoping to take out of this trip. And we feel as if our um, curriculum depends greatly on having this kind of opportunity available to our students. We do have this kind of opportunity available to our French students. Um, a group of students goes to Quebec um, every handful of years. So students in North Reading High School before they graduate do have access to that trip. But we currently don't have anything for our students in, enrolled in Spanish language classes. Um, so I took here a few um, different um, a few different strands and a few different um, standards that a uh, trip would um, connect to other curriculums as well. Um, you know, you can take a quick glance and you know, I think stating the obvious, this trip wouldn't just enhance language learning, um, but would enhance a student's general um, general experience here at North Reading High School. Um, and then um, I took a few um, a few quotes from our own um, core value and belief system, our 21st century learning expectations, as well as um, from our rubric on civic and social um, expectations that you know these values that we're trying to give our students, um, and we can really do it properly by putting them on an airplane and bringing them to a Spanish-speaking country and immersing them in um, a culture um, is something that you know we've we've been saying here in North Reading for a long time. It's very important to us. Um, so um, the details about Costa Rica, and then like I said, um, just to kind of follow along here, um, this side here I think is a little bit easier to look at at a glance that our curriculum is um, really focused on what we call the five C's, and the communication piece is very obvious when our, these students go to Costa Rica. Um, you know, this trip is for students taking Spanish classes only. Um, it will be in, conducted entirely in Spanish in the target language, so that hits the communication piece, the cultural piece, um, as Ana will show. Um, this trip is a little different than other trips that the high school usually runs, as in the kids will not just be sightseeing the whole time. They're really going to have the opportunity to attend classes to um, to eat lunch, you know, and have informal interactions with locals, but then also have more formal interactions um, with scientists and um, other um, other professionals um, that correlate with the activities that we'll do. Um, so that cultural piece is really hit. Uh, making connections, I think, it jumps out very obviously as well. The comparisons piece as well, um, and then um, lastly, the communities piece. That world language. It's important to us that we show our students that um, world languages are used right here in North Reading. They're used in Massachusetts. But um, of course, there's lots of diverse communities out there, and we want to expose our students to as many as we can. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, hi. <laughs> I'm having one. Kid. 
Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the tour details for Costa Rica. We're really excited about this trip and uh, we believe that it's truly going to bring an experience to our students uh, taking Spanish classes and the students that really want to take their learning like a step beyond uh, just the classroom. And of course, we do a lot of activities in the classroom. We do like field trips, but we believe this is an experience that the students will definitely benefit from. Uh, and that, as Amy explained, that ties with the curriculum, with ties with the program, and with the five Cs. Um, so we are looking for, of course, a language immersion. All tourist activities will be in Spanish. And is yes, it definitely has the sightseeing piece, everything that gets the students very excited. But also, it has the leadership seminars. It has workshops with scientists. And this doesn't mean like they're gonna be just in a classroom, just instead of being here in a classroom in Costa Rica, this is actually being at the places where they're going to be learning. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit. These are some uh, of the activities, some sample activities as well. Um, so for example, if they're learning about, um, let me see what is, so I have it over here. So if they're going to learning about the five intertidal um, uh, zones, so they're going to be snorkeling. They're gonna be learning about it. They're gonna be comparing. They're gonna be talking to researchers about it. It's not just being there and, and just listening about it. So they're gonna be actually experiencing that. Another is one just to visit uh, volcanoes in Costa Rica. It's a big place about volcanoes. They're gonna be there learning, talking to a volcanologist and learning and comparing and everything is gonna be in Spanish. So we believe this is gonna be a great experience for the students. They're gonna learn about renewable energy sources. We're gonna be at an oyster farm. They're gonna be learning about it. Uh, another topics are recycling. So they're, they're gonna be like talking about it. We're gonna be visiting places that they're gonna kind of uh, also talk about it. Uh, they're gonna be spending time also with students in Costa Rica so they can kind of also share and talk about uh, the uh, all the stuff. Um, that's just an example of some of the things the students will be doing, and I'm so excited about it. And of course, they're gonna be snorkeling, they're gonna be like canoping tour, they're gonna be horseback riding, everything that gets also the students very excited, but at the same time, they're gonna be learning, they're gonna be talking, they're gonna be exposing themselves in the language. So there's a video over there, I'm not gonna show it, it takes a little bit, but even uh, experiences from students, from previous students, in, even in another school, they say when they got there, uh, their English and Spanish, they were right here and just day by day, like it was less Spanish, more English. And even though it is like an eight day trip, we believe this is gonna be an experience that can change the student's life or the way they see things, the way uh, they see the language and the communities. Um, this is just a little bit, uh, about comparing, not, not comparing, but like how uh, the students, uh, we can support another trip because this is a different trip. We have the students, uh, the trips that the students, if they wanna tour, they can tour, but this is a language immersion tour. And we believe we have uh, students that are gonna be very interested in um, coming to this trip. Uh, this is just very general um, educational goal for our trips. Again, as I say, we're gonna be talking about geographies, histories, influence uh, on Costa Rican culture, also the importance of preserving endangered species uh, and diverse topographic. These are just kind of very general topics we're gonna be uh, talking about. And this is uh, work, working with this company, ACIS. They have like years and years of experience and they have brought like other schools as well to international uh, trips. And this is just what, like very general stuff that they um, keep in mind. Um, yeah, it's kind of the same. So AC store manager, so that's all the things that we get included, daily breakfast, dinners, excursion tours, basic protection plan, three and four uh, star hotels, uh, round trip flights. So that's everything like it is also uh, very similar to the EF trips that have been very successful here at our school. I don't know if you have anything else to add? Yeah, I was going to say, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking you're seeing what we're, what we're seeing here in that sense of our historical large groups uh, to, to another country or, you know, Europe, a number of countries where, uh, and having recently gone on last year um, to uh, Budapest and Slovenia, et cetera, and kind of, again, being in that a cultural immersion piece, learning about new, uh, new places, new people, being challenged, and asked to try this, do this, you know, think about 
this piece of this culture and how, how they get to this. I will, I will tell you, I mean, you're, you're driving through Croatia and there are bullet holes all along the side of certain houses. Um, that's pretty real. It's pretty, it's pretty striking. Uh, not that long ago. Um, but looking at, well, what's, what's the alternative piece to this experience? We, we don't have a language immersion opportunity. We don't have a, uh, a trip for 12 students that have gone at least through Spanish 3 and are ready to uh, take, take a hyper-focused experience in another country, full-time uh, immersion with language, and uh, you know that it's, it's, it's a unique and different, uh, and I think it's, it's missing. Um, and I'm hoping we could kind of fill it, fill that gap. I mean, if the French can do it, we can let the Spanish do it too. But so I think I think I'll begin the questions because I believe we probably all have the exact same questions to begin the specifics of it. I mean, I think I caught that it was an eight day trip yeah. in February of 2021. But yeah. when exactly is it? What's the proposed cost of this? Um, do you think are we going to have to narrow down to get to 12 students? I mean, do you think there's an interest beyond that? Um, I mean, you want to talk? That's a logistical question. Yeah. I think that's. So, yeah, we're hoping for at least like 12 students so we can bring like two chaperones, but it's definitely open if more students are interested. So, that will be kind of the minimal to be like a private private tour. Yeah. Uh, I think, part, I think yeah. part of it is like is to kind of go maybe 12 to 15 mm. and really, really say like uh, to the students, you are looking for, you've demonstrated. A uh, high level of proficiency with the language at this point, and you're really looking for this immersive immersion experience. Uh, so I see it quite different than um, the other trip. I know the other trip does kind of fill fast. I see this in the same way, but really trying to keeping it small um, initially uh, to, 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 to you know to make sure it's successful. Number one, we want it to run, um, but. They really have it at the other the other side of the travel experience for students. Mm -hmm. And what what's the cost and the exact dates of this? Uh, well, uh, do we have the dates exactly? It's going to be February vacation. February vacation. Yes, vacation. I don't know exactly yeah. the we, dates we run, in my we mind. Run it the same way yeah. we run the the other trip, the right. EF trip, yeah. the ACIS trip. We'll it's April vacation. We'll probably start on that Friday of break, mm -hmm. of February, the Friday before break, and then run through and then come back the next weekend. Yeah. We're just uh, deciding the last activities, so the price is gonna be between 3,000 and, and 3,500. So we are, it's pretty much about the same as the EF trips that the school offer every year. So it's gonna be somewhere around that. We're just defining the last activities that the students will do. And, and is there any experience with a company? I mean, is that is that company one that we've worked with on other ones? Like, Yes, okay. it's a company that we use for Quebec, yes. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that the students are ready for this, even though everything is gonna be in the target language. Uh, right now, I'm currently teaching Spanish three academic and honor uh, classes, but I'm also teaching the Spanish five students. And it's amazing what the students can say and speak. Like lately, we do a lot of, um, let's say presentational, we do like interpersonal communication, and it's amazing what they can talk about the topics we are, we're talking about, like the Civil War in Argentina in 1978, we've been talking, and they're not even reading, they're not even memorizing, they're just like talking and they're asking questions. It is amazing the way these students can communicate. So I'm conf confident a trip like this, it'll be like, it will definitely help the students and benefit them even more for their future careers. Will this have any um, accreditation towards the biliteracy? No. no, not formally, no, other than the experiential piece, no. Yeah, but I mean, I, I'm co the students next year, um, well, they've been doing, this year they did uh, the test in October, they did the silo by literacy, and I'm so proud to say that all the students in Spanish 5, they took the test, they all got the seal with distinction. Yeah, with distinction or the seal, we have both, right? But I'm so happy to say that everybody got it, so that's amazing, yeah. That shows the level of Spanish that the students have now, because they have been studying that for, I mean, four years at the high school plus uh, the middle school, and it's amazing what they can do with the language now. Uh, I have a look. Danich? I was just gonna ask, is there a specific reason why Costa Rica was chosen over other Spanish-speaking countries? 
Uh, well, Costa Rica is very tied to the curriculum, especially in Spanish too. Everybody, all the students learn about Costa Rica. And lately it's been so popular about uh, all the nature that has to offer, talking about renewable, to, talking about, um, I got all the, um, yeah, uh, renewable energy sources. I feel like it has a lot to offer. Uh, it is a very beautiful country. It is a very, I would say like peaceful and the beach and the weather, we just feel like it's gonna be a, a great opportunity. And these two star, I mean, of course, there's so many other countries that we are excited about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Any, anything else you wanna add? You teach Costa Rica this year? <laughs> So, uh, I had, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a quick question. Um, so like AJ was saying, we, there's lots of great trips and wonderful trips that, that uh, are offered at the high school. Um, and this one seems to be unique from them in that it's a, it's a real push for, uh, for that, uh, that component where it's immersion. Yeah. And it makes me wonder <clears throat> if there might be some students that either overestimate their own abilities or comfort in an immersive environment, but really are interested in Costa Rica and are applying for it. And if you guys have thought about a mechanism for how do you decide if students are ready or aren't ready for this particular type of trip? Oh, well, this uh, trip offers, like, also we have to do some activities, some research beforehand, so by the, so when we go, they're prepared for that. So we're going to be studying and, and researching some of these topics. So they're going to be kind of learning ahead of time, so they will know, they will have maybe their questions, they will have something to to, to share something to compare when they get together with other students with the uh, with other uh, young students in uh, in Costa Rica, so I don't know if that answers your question, but the students will be prepared before that. So it's something different also than the that the tour, uh, touristic trips that they yeah they can maybe even check what, okay what places I'm gonna be looking at. Uh, monuments and everything, but also this one, they're gonna be studying a little bit more about Costa Rica, studying about these topics. And this is very tied with um, with science classes. So that's what we love about this trip, is not just Spanish. This is like so broad, that they're gonna be learning some other stuff that they can apply in other areas. Yeah. Rich? I, I kinda wanna ask that question a little differently. Um, is there a subset of the universe of students who might sort of qualify the trip who, is there a group that might on paper qualify but you would not feel comfortable letting go? I mean, I guess I'm, I'm trying to say, say if there's a, is it everyone who's at a certain level that they'd be qualified to go or uh, are you making sort of more, uh, uh, some judgments about that as well? So, um, so I think, you know, I, everything we offer in our department is very inclusive, and we provide whatever support is needed or remediation is needed to make these sorts of things accessible to all students. And that's true for the trip of Quebec. There's no rules for Quebec that you have to have an A or you have to pass a test to go. Um, and we currently, while we don't take students abroad, we do take students every year to a restaurant where they have to order in the target language, chit chat with friends, you know, ask for a refill of water say, hey, I'm missing a fork, all of the above in Spanish. And the same thing with that is, you know, we support them and we make it accessible to them. And so the same will be true in this trip. Um, certainly the North Reading teachers that go will be bilingual, Spanish and English, um, for support that's needed. Um, ACIS has, you know, offers bilingual um, tour guides as well. Um, and so while we don't want to give our students too much support and too much of a cushion in English, because once you're in that survival situation, that's when your mind really opens. And that's part of the purpose of this trip is really just getting the kids in there. And it's like, if you want to eat, remember how to say, you know, remember how to say it. And that's when it really sticks. Um, so we definitely want that um, survival aspect, um, you know, to open up the mind to learning. But at the same time, there'll be all the support a student could need. And absolutely any student um, who signs up for this trip will have fun, will learn something, and will have a memorable experience. So you're saying everyone's going to eat. <laughs> I, I just have one more question and or, or comment and I, I, I think I bring this up on every trip but um, I hope it's I, I hope there are opportunities for students who, who can't afford the, the, the fare or the full fare that, uh, that that we provide support for that and more importantly I hope that it's that we make that aware make make that known to the students as we're presenting the trip so that someone just doesn't shut down because and say with I know I can't afford that um, uh, that we're that we're making clear what we are able to do to, to help students who who have trouble affording um, as we're presenting the trip so that so that 
no one gets discouraged right off the bat. At the end of the day, people are going to have to do what they can do. But uh, I think that's one of the reasons that we wanted to get this in early so we could start doing some fundraising and, and yep. you know, doing what we could to, to make it as accessible to as many kids that, you know, really want that. Again, I really see that we, we had this conversation where we spoke with the AACIS representative over the summer. I want this to be, uh, like the student that's interested in this is dramatically different than the student says, I, you know, I want to really go to Norway. I haven't done that. I want yeah. to see what that, that land is like. No, the first thing is I want a completely immersive experience in, in the language I've been studying. That really should drive uh, registration. Um, yep. And it should be anywhere, but that it's the experience that I want. Really <laughs> testing myself with the language that I'm learning in a culture that I'm trying to become more uh, familiar with. Um, so again, I think that's, that's another reason around that fundraising piece. And um, just as a quick comparison, um, the schools that I network with and I work with in the area um, pretty much all offer um, exchange programs as well as um, tours in every language that they um, teach. And so for a world language department or a school to offer several options and several different types of options um, is certainly not out of the norm um, you know, in neighboring, neighboring towns and um, surrounding communities. There's no other discussion. Can I have a motion to approve the trip? I move to uh, approve the Costa Rican trip for February of 2021. Second. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chris, where's the Latin trip going? Is Just. Uh, you really only get one choice with that one. <laughs> just one moment as we say, I just want to thank Mr. LaPrette for a great presentation. I thought all of our teachers and students did a wonderful job tonight. Um, really well spoken. I thought uh, hearing from the students expressing about student engagement and, and what personalized learning looks like was, was excellent. Um, thank you to Ms. Ms. Castro. I, I just want to take a moment also to thank um, Amy St. Arnold. She's not only our high school teacher here, she's also our 6 to 12 world language leader and you know she's to me sort of the exemplar of what I look for in a curriculum leader in the district she works to advocate for our middle school program expanding uh, sixth grade uh, this year seventh grade next year um, coursework to try to get more students engaged she's you know we spent a lot of time together as assistant superintendent now as superintendent trying to push forward she um, brought our seal by literacy program here through a study group last year was very active in getting that going but is also active at the state level trying to get these things pushed through she's working with um, the state on the new framework she's sort of an ambassador I think might be the official title I'm um, trying to get those new frameworks up and running so I just wanted to sort of publicly recognize her for all the great work so thank you thank you thank, thank you all thank you <laughs> the only suggestion is when you're talking about the trip you went on for the school don't mention bullet holes <laughs> 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 <Fair little thing. laughs> okay, so moving on. Now we, two more things. So no continued business. The bus transportation contract. Great. Superint our assistant superintendent Connolly. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so this evening, I'm, I would like to take a look at our bus transportation uh, contract, and we do have a recommendation um, this evening as well for your consideration. So you may recall last year I uh, was up. I presented um, some data about the the transportation market and and what, what was happening and some, some there was some detailed information. Um, so North Reading Transportation Incorporation is our current uh, provider. Um, we have an option to renew for the fifth and final year of that existing agreement, which would extend their contract through. Uh, the fiscal year 2021, so all of next school year through June 30, 2021. Um, as I just mentioned, we did kind of an extensive market analysis last December. As I sit here this evening, about a year later, uh, there really hasn't been any significant change in the market conditions um, a year later that I think would warrant um, uh, you know, a, a change of what was recommended a year ago. Um, the bus transportation market in Massachusetts continues to experience an increase. Again, there is a variety of factors at play that are, that are resulting in, in why many districts that have gone out to bid over the last three to five years uh, time frame have seen a significant uh, hike in their, their transportation rates. Um, I did include a comparison of daily bus rates and update to that of surrounding communities for both the current fiscal year 2020 and, and next year 2021. 
Um, I think as the data shows and as the comparison of the, some of the, the area communities that have recently gone out to bid, that the current market conditions is, would be, uh, I feel if we were to go out to bid and not renew, we would see a higher, higher daily rate. Um, you know, the, the, the average price of the current market is really in the $375 per day per bus, and we would experience about $355 next year with our current, current rate. So I've spoken to a lot of area business managers. I've spoken to some local, local um, other and bus companies, and we, I think we, by structuring the bid four years ago and giving an option to go out to five years, I think it, to be able to, to analyze the market conditions these last, these, these optional years um, proved that it was beneficial to have the option to go uh, that, that five-year term. Um, so this, uh, this evening, I'm sort of prepared to make the recommendation that we um, renew the, the agreement for the, the, the fifth and final year for North Reading Transportation. Um, also, that being said, I, I think things have gone very smoothly this year with North Reading Transportation. Um, you know, I know we had some, some issues in the past where we certainly worked through them with some of the, the bus drivers. Um, I think this year they've done a, a pretty consistent um, you know, job and uh, they've certainly uh, have it certainly, certainly improved over these last couple of couple of school years. So um, I think it's the, the prudent decision <coughs> to recommend us to extend uh, the option for their <coughs> final year. And at this point, I'll open it up to any, any questions. Uh, yeah, I have a question, Michael. So uh, looking over the uh, fiscal year 20, right, ours seem to be uh, right around the median, right, right, right around the, 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 the midpoint for a lot of them. But you can see that going to next year, a lot of them take a hike up that's much more substantial than what we'll be, that's right. we'll be going into. I'm wondering if there's an expectation that with this being the last option year, if we'll see a we expect to see a sizable jump in going to 22. I, I think that right now I would say yes. Yeah. I, you know, I, th I think we're at, you know, 3, 355. I think that is, um, you know, about the median, maybe slightly below the average. And <coughs> we, you know, I, I hope things change, you know, a year from now when we're probably putting out that bid. But most likely, you know, I, I've seen, you know, area communities go out to bid and, and, and suddenly it's, it's in the <coughs> 400 range or above 400. So, that's where the, the market is trending, unbelievably. You know, five years ago, we were at two, 280. 280. Oh, wow. um, so within that five-year window, you know, we, we experienced it five years ago when we went back out to bid. I think we went from 280 to 330 um, in that first year. And that was a pretty sizable increase that we dealt with. And then, um, so I, I think we'll see an increase um, more to the, again, 375 to, to 380. That's what it it's tends to be happening right now. Um, you know, maybe things will change in, 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 in the market or in the economy that would alter <coughs> that. But um, the other thing that's a challenge is just, is just getting competitive bids. It's, you know, part of the survey I included or asked for, um, and these were, the, these were the area districts that responded, um, you know, how many bids did, did folks receive? And, um, you know, folks are only receiving one, one or two bids, and, and that, that's always a challenge throughout the state. Um, we analyzed three or four years ago, um, actually maybe even less than that, a year or two ago, you know, options to um, kind of regionalize and, and look to go into bid with, with area communities to see if that would increase com competitiveness. Um, there was an attempt by some Metro West communities, Western communities, to do that. It, it was not successful. It didn't really yield the results they were hoping for. So it's a challenge that, that everyone's facing. Um, and you know, you know, hopefully we'll make that a, as a competitive process, and we'll get, we'll get, we'll see where we're at a, a year's <coughs> time. Um, but you know, I think at this point in the stage, I think that the, the best prudent and fiscally sound decision is to to renew that fifth year and and, and continue to <coughs> see what we can do as we look to next, the, you know, the future. Are the uh, uh, the TBDs are they in a search? Uh, uh, they are, right yeah. Now? So they, those are the districts that <coughs> have no choice but to go out to bid. Um, their, their final year is, is this year, so um, they had not gone out to bid to date. Um, so so yep. they'll, be, they'll be issuing a bid uh, at some point this year for FY21. Janine? Michael, um, five years ago when we went out to bid and it went from 280 to 3 330 something. About $50. Increase. We increased the bus fees. To come we did. For part <coughs> we of did, that. yeah. So we helped. We tried to offset that. Um, not that you have a... a 
silver ball or whatever, crystal ball. Um, do you foresee maybe the need to do it or um, the budget, can it be absorbed? I, you know, any, any increase um, of a fixed cost to that level is always, as we know, where is always difficult um, and for the operational budget to absorb. What we've tried to do and uh, is we've tried to make the, the optional busing program for those families that don't qualify for free busing, but would still, you know, opt to, um, to tr you know, to opt for transportation and for busing, is to, to make that, um, you know, the, the amount that you're collecting from the fee being charged and make that kind of self-supportive of that optional program. So right now, if we, weren't to, if we were to only bus the number of students that we are required by law to bus, K through six, you know, greater than two miles, we would be required to have five buses. So we, as you know, we, we operate 10 buses a year. So the amount that we collect from the fee and the, and the amount um, that's in the operational <coughs> budget is not quite a 50-50 split. It's not quite five buses. So we're subsidizing the amount of that optional program in our operational budget um, slightly. Um, and I think we would, to me, you always kind of want to watch that, that formula and not to have potentially the operational budget subsidize um, you know, it's, a, it's a, so much of a, a, a much that it then kind of, it, it would take away from the other, other needs of the operational budget. And that's, that's kind of the, the decisions we get into every year when we, when we analyze the, the instructional piece, which is always the fir first and foremost of what we're trying to do. And when you get into the kind of the operationally and the fixed costs. So I think it will be a decision we'll have to face at the time. And you know, I, I, I hope that it's not as substantial that we'll, we'll look at a, a fee increase because obviously we, we never, we kind of want to hopefully go the other way over time and not, and not, not face that. But just um, to clarify, you're talking about uh, on a new contract. On a new yeah. contract. The $5 increase per day is not going to result. No. In, no. I just want to make, no. yeah. clarify for everyone who might be listening. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, because um, it went from 280 to 3. 330. <coughs> so that, it that could increase go was. From 355 up into the 400. So that's a significant yeah. increase right. as well. So that, so that, I just yeah. that so increase I was so significant at the time in that budget year that we, we had to, we felt like we had to do something. And, yep. and, and we also we also have a reserve or an operating account that we've been eating into the last couple of years, correct? We Correct. I mean, what is that down? What is that looking like right now? The reserve fund for buses. So we've we've uh, fortunately been able to keep a, a a pretty healthy reserve in the bus transportation revolving account. Um, to uh, we essentially have about a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars of a reserve, um, and you know each year, if we were only to to um, have a, a budgetary offset. That would take in the revenue that we're collecting. That that offset would be about two hundred and seventy-five thousand uh, dollars, because that's the, the amount of the revenue that we we, we take in annually. Um, that offset's much higher because every year we anticipate using a piece of that reserve, about about half of that reserve. So that offset's actually about three hundred and forty-five thousand. And then fortunately, every year when we get to the end, <coughs> we don't necessarily have to to use all the money in that revolving account because things have happened over the course of the year, and there, there's some money. Available in in the operating budget to 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 limit that 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 uh, amount of that reserve and not take it everything. So we've been in that situation over the last five years. It's it, it's it's hard to say what will happen on a year to year basis. Mm -hmm. But I think it's I think it's good fiscal um, you know budgeting and to to not to keep to maintain a reserve. I always say you want about fifteen to twenty percent in an account like the like this like the in each revolving account. Um, but we're in a good, healthy amount with our revolving accounts. Should um, you know, should we experience an increase and not not want to do a significant user fee increase or user fee increase at all, and not impact an operational budget in any one year? If, that, if that's what you're asking, I think we're yeah. I'm just just wondering. I mean, I I, I, I don't know if other. I mean, there was a parent that reached out about fees to me this week. I don't know if other people got the email, but you know, again, one bus fee is one thing, and I think. I think it's important what you just said, where like it's you know there are certain things that are required by the state, and there are others that are mm -hmm. that are not. And I think we try to offer as many services, as many extracurriculars as we can, while not you know while not impacting the overall curriculum in the in the district. And so I think we do a good job with that. I think 
I think we're all, I think everybody here has the same feeling. I don't think, it's, I think it's a no brainer about next year. I think we're all just worried about what the next contract is going right. to look like. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we're going to start that and if there's any creative options. Like, I mean, I know that last year, I think there was something floating around where some communities are not owning the buses, but trying to staff the buses. And I don't know if there's, if there's any appetite for those sorts of discussions for the next contract where, I don't know. I, I don't know when we're going to begin any of this. I mean, what, what, when would you start negotiating the next so contract? I typically, I, I'm always someone that likes to kind of send out a bid early. And, and so I've typically sent out a transportation contract around this time of year, December, January, for the succeeding, preceding year. Um, so we can kind of get those bids in, analyze it. Um, if we don't like what we're seeing, then you still have time to kind of reject those bids, go back out, which we've done in the past. If, if you wait too long um, and you're sending out a bid in, in late spring, March or April, which some districts do, those are coming back in, I think, too late to respond to any surprise, budgetary surprise. And then if the numbers come in in, in you know, January, early February, they can be part of the budget development conversation at that time and you have a better opportunity to react to any, any surprises or any, any increases um, and, to then, and then make some, some maybe some creative decision decisions, you know, do you want something different or, or how, you know, how can you reduce the cost? Um, so that's typically what would be happening. It would kind of be an advertisement bid, bid season of December, January, and then uh, analyzing those bids and executing a contract, um, you know, you know, early March for the, for the following year. Um, Michael, just sorry, one last thing um, that just popped into my mind. If are we are you ever in a better situation when they know you don't have to sign a new contract because you're at the end of your life cycle with a contract? Like if we were to go to bid this time around, knowing that we're not, we can exercise that fifth year, you know, yeah. when when people come in and bid and they know you have to choose a new contract, right? Are their prices not as competitive because you're in a different position? Um. I, I don't think it has a huge significant okay. impact from my my experience has been yeah. as when I've when I've gone out to bid I, at times we've uh, not uh, for different types of services and you know we've done that um, just to kind of you know it doesn't just to kind of test the market and see you know we can always reject it and then just extend yeah. um, what typically happens especially in this in transportation and food service and and, and cleaning and all different things is that. You sort of frustrate the folks involved in, in um, you know, there'll be ten. Sometimes it tends to sort of backfire or go out, go yeah. higher the next time, especially yeah. when they know competition is limited. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, I, I think the market tends to drive it, and, and what's going on with with gasoline prices and the different things going on with um, in the state with you know, prevailing wage laws and, and, and health care and, and everything that seems to you know, to drive the, these rates. And unfortunately, um, everyone's dealing with kind of a, a shortage of quality substitute, uh, I'm sorry, of quality bus drivers. And when there's a, a shortage, you know, you tend to have to pay them more and then that drives up, the, the, you know, the rates as well. And I think, I think that um, is probably having probably the, the largest impact right now on on the market, o really over you know gasoline prices and, and different things going on with um, affordable health care and, and, and the new sick leave law act, which was passed, and those are certainly having a factor. But this, we've just seen a, a just you know just a shortage of, of quality drivers. Yeah, I do feel like like even if there was more competition, the prices wouldn't be all that much different because I don't think so. Yeah, it's just, it's just um, the bottom level of the cost. So. Right. I think the, the only thing that gives me any, any hope at all is if you look at NRT, NRT's been somewhat reasonable. I mean, Wilmington has a contract that goes through 23, and it, it's only going up $10, $10 to 363 next yep. year. Yep. You know, I mean, Wakefield, they were at was 333 last year, and so, you know, they have to have to see negotiate it. And, Same thing with Trump. And yeah, the only one that looks quite a bit lower was highly dissatisfied as level of satisfaction, so... I mean, I think NRT seems to have been a good partner with us, and so hopefully they will be, right. you know, in the future. It seems yeah. like it seems like they have some of the ones closest to us geographically, and so it might be, you know, I don't know hopefully right. they, they like trying to keep this whole region, and so. Yeah, my, that's my hope, hope as well. Yeah. NRT is a larger company than some of these other companies on here, <coughs> um, so sometimes they have a little bit more 
bargaining power with the equipment and purchasing new equipment to keep um, a price a little bit lower than some of the smaller companies. That's what we saw five years ago. Yeah. Good. Um, so. so can we have a vote or a motion on uh, to accept? I mean, assuming that we want to accept the recommendation of uh, Mr. Connolly. Sure. I, I move that uh, we exercise the optional fifth year of the regular school bus transportation contract to NRT from July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2021. Second. Any other discussion or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I, I know, I mean, I, you do a great presentation, and I think, again, I think, I think we need your uh, skills for the next contract uh, more than we need it for the recommendation today. Great. No, thank you. Um, next, the uh, academic calendar, Dr. Daly. I mean, this usually goes pretty easily and quickly. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for hearing this tonight. So as you recall, we presented uh, this a few months ago. We had some discussion. We, it, was, it was suggested at the end that we take it back to our, our uh, Teachers Association just to, to float the idea of possibly doing a, f a day or two before the school year started. Um, ultimately, um, it was a great conversation back and forth, but it was decided that we would just stay with um, the traditional after Labor Day start for everyone, including um, the teacher's professional day being in March. And so the calendar that you have before you um, preserves what I think was, was uh, the intent of the committee, which was to have the uh, students starting on Tuesday, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the students starting on Wednesday, the teachers and all the, uh, the groups come back for the welcome back on the 8th. Um, that does put our last day of school on the 29th of June, but I'm uh, if optimistic there's five snow days. that uh, if there's five snow days, right? I'm optimistic that we'll have uh, a, a great uh, winter next year and we'll be in, we'll be in good <laughs> shape. It's a little bit of an unusual year, but I do think uh, it was you know, and I think I think I agree. John agreed also. You know, this is uh, a, a tradition that we have here in North Reading, and I think it's one that's that's worth preserving. And the teachers, everyone uh, felt that that was a good idea. I think they did appreciate the opportunity to to talk about it a little bit more. Um, I know that it was a great process, very democratic. They, they had some surveys and got data, and uh, there was definitely a lot of discussion, but ultimately this is where we are. But they, you know, they did, they did say for the future they want to continue to have some uh, discussions, and we have some, uh, some good opportunities to, to be creative here in the future as well. So. Well, thank you. thank you very much. I would just comment. I know there's been some discussion. I've seen some. I've been tagged in some Facebook uh, forums about this, and, 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 I, and I, I hope everybody understands when – Unfortunately, when Labor Day falls on September 7th, it's a challenging calendar no matter what because, you know, it, it, you know it, it's later. And so it means you're either pushing it later and you're ending later in June or you're starting before Labor Day. And I think, uh, I think actually Chris said it very well when we had the discussion before where, you know, if there's a reason that we can see to change what's been done in the past, I, I think we're all, you know, willing to make changes. But... We've done this for however many years. I mean, it's, you know, Labor Day's fallen on September 7th before, and, you know, we've, we've managed to get by with it before. And so, you know, absent some reason, I think it's nice for the community to understand that, you know, generally, unless there's a specific reason, we're going to start after Labor Day. And I think that's what we're saying. So I appreciate the teachers considering it, and we weren't trying to make them decide they wanted to start before Labor Day if they didn't want to, just... You know, I think just from the discussion before, we, you know, we felt that, I, I know that I felt that for, you know, parents that are planning on their summers, it's, you know, just nice to have a consistent idea year over year. Yep. So thank you very much for taking it back to the teachers. Um, if there's no other discussion, can we have a motion to accept the 2021 academic school calendar? Sure. I move to accept the school calendar for 2020 to 2021. Okay, any other discussion or comments? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, moving on to some routine matters here. So <coughs> first we have the minutes from the last meeting. So first we have the, can somebody uh, make a motion for the executive session of December 9th? I'll make a motion to accept the executive session of December 9th as written. I second. Okay, and so Diana wasn't there, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so 4-0 with one abstention. And on the regular meeting of December 9th? 
I'll make a motion to accept the meeting, open meeting session of December 9th with the exception of when the motion was called back into open session. It was done so by Chris and myself as Mrs. Beltwell was not here. <coughs> we felt her presence though that day. <laughs> Why, thank you. The only other exception I would make is technically I voted not to adjourn because I did not want to help Mr. Bernard leave. So no, no. technically it was three to one. <coughs> Thanks, I Scott. I on that one. <coughs> what was that? I, I'm still, I, I still want to stay in session for that one. So I voted three to one. <laughs> okay. We have a second. <laughs> second, I did it. So. <laughs> for a second. a second. Yes, I do. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> So with those Thank corrections, you. any any other comments or changes? Nope. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passes four to zero with one abstention. Okay, moving on to the budget update. Mr. Connell, you seem to have been spending a lot on coaches. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, w one quick um, note on the report, and I apologize. Uh, I tried to update um, some of the numbers uh, early last week before the packet went out to reflect activity as far through December as I could. And when I did that to a couple numbers on the payroll side, the committed and the encumbered column didn't, didn't adjust as it should. So please don't be alarmed by um, two line items there, the extracurricular uh, line item and the coach's line item. Uh, we are not uh, running a deficit or a projected deficit there. So the, uh, the um, Committed column for the coaches should not read 213 and change. It should read 164 and change. And the extracurricular amount should, should not read 6918. It should read 52998. So that, that would bring those two line items in, in, in balance. And it actually would make our available projected balance total you know, higher, about 336,000. So I, I apologize for that. I was trying to update the numbers quickly uh, before the packet went out last week. I didn't pick up on that. Um, but essentially, the report, as, as is typical, is br breaks it down into two reports, expenses and payroll activity. It essentially reflects all financial activity through December 31, 2019, the end of the second quarter. Uh, many of the budget drivers that I presented at the last report are still the same. Um, I think we're in, you know, as you can see, forward financial standing um, at, you know, midway through the fiscal year. As I spoke of earlier, uh, we did experience um, some unanticipated maintenance costs um, during the first quarter of the year, uh, mainly to redress um, replacement of three membranes at the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, we had to replace in um, the little school, elementary school main fire panel. That was unanticipated. And as we've gotten into the heating season, particularly at the little and hood elementary schools, we have had some high needs to address some heating equipment repairs um, so that have been costly. Um, so I will say we've been able to address any of these unanticipated costs um, at this point through the, through the budget, um, you know, may, in part due to the assistance of the re restored extra ordinary maintenance line item this fiscal year. Um, but I think it would just, I would just note that we perhaps have a lessened ability for the district to address unforeseen costs particularly as it relates to, to the, the building and grounds uh, area, but we'll just continue to monitor these costs as we move through the fiscal year. And on that note, if I can, Michael, I mean, I think we not only, we, we went through the entire amount that we set aside in that extra, we did. extraordinary. That and the, the, the yeah, I mean, in years past that have been cut. I mean, I think that's something that I know I've been concerned about in the past on, you know, mm -hmm. about when we, when we get rid of anything about, you know, anything that might go wrong, like we, we, wrote, we walked a tightrope a few years, and this year would have been disastrous if we didn't have that set aside. And I think that we when, didn't, no, when we're in the process of doing budgeting for the future, I think we need to be very careful because, you know, some of the some of the equipment at some of the elementary, elementary schools in particular, and that, you know, the uh, wastewater treatment plant have some very high expenses. And if it's on our budget, I think we we don't ever want to be taking away from the educational. Exactly. You know, it cost right. in order to, you know, replace membranes at a wastewater right. treatment. And so I think we need to make I sure agree. that we have sufficient reserves because, again, that ate into educational money this year because those things needed to be replaced and it went beyond what we had budgeted. So. 
Yeah, no, that's a good, it's a very good point, uh, <coughs> Mr. Buckley. So it's certainly, we've worked on, um, and we, we did a pretty good job in fiscal 20, uh, restoring some of these line items to a place, <coughs> place that reflected actuals where we felt we, we should be, but um, you know, we're certainly, you know, seeing an increase in, in maintenance and uh, um, building maintenance and grounds lines. We've, we've seen that at this campus, you know, to upkeep this campus as well as the wastewater treatment plant continues to be a high cost item um, that is only going, only increasing um, with, with the needs of that building, especially as, you know, some of that equipment, there's a lot of equipment in there, membranes, tubes, pumps, that have a five to seven year you know, shelf life. And believe it or not, we're, we're, we're in the seventh year of, the, um, believe, of, of this building and, and that, that plant being in, in operation as we look till next year. So it will certainly be important to look at what's, what's happening in, in, in the elementary schools. Some of this, the heating equipment and the HVACs and so forth, they're, they're older and, 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 some, and we're starting to see those break down and, and need some repairs. So, I think when we look at our maintenance budget, when we look at things like extraordinary maintenance, which by law we're able to budget for, and then we look at small <coughs> capital and equipment lines, which all lines that in these tough budget economic times have been either reduced or eliminated um, these, to try to, um, to prioritize those and try to allocate funding in that area to, to address some of these, these needs. Um, we've certainly encumbered all our utility expenses. We do that each year. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would be very excited if the weather we experienced this past weekend continues over the next few months. <laughs> Too bad it didn't happen that's during unlikely. school day, so we didn't have to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but, you know, we'll continue to monitor our utility costs. I don't see any, any cost for alarm. <coughs> Anything's going to be out of budget as we, move, as we move through the fiscal year and certainly the heating season. Um, the food service program continues to be a, a positive uh, uh, light of information where the first th three months of the school year, um, the program has, has done very, very well. Um, we've earned a, a net profit of a little over $12,000. Um, still waiting for the final numbers of December. I think we did experience a loss in December. I usually get those about mid-month. Um, December was a challenging month. It typically is. We lost two operating days. That's always a challenge. Um, but I think we're still in very good shape about midway through the, the school year. Um, m average mail sold per day almost at every school is up significantly at the middle school. High school continues to be up. The bachelor school is doing very, very well, um, and the Hood and Melillo are doing are responding well, pretty, pretty similar to last year. So, um, we have breakfast at each of the schools. That's that's been doing okay. It's still not huge participation at the Hood and Melillo. The bachelor a little bit, a little bit greater. Um, it's year two at the bachelor elementary school, but I think it's great that we're offering that as well. Um, on the payroll side. Um, everything is certainly within budgeted ranges. As I mentioned the last time, um, you're seeing some higher balances in certain line items than we've certainly had in the past, and th certainly the central office, mainly due to um, the central office, um, two central office supports positions this year, um, kind of remain un unfilled, as in we're certainly leveraging existing staff's roles to fill the responsibilities right now as we kind of evaluate the long-term solution. Um, you know, we don't see that as being a, a, a long-term uh, solution. There'll definitely be some areas as we approach, you know, fiscal 21 and get into these conversations to, to address. But, um, you know, we're certainly seeing um, as a result this fiscal year, um, at this point in the year, uh, you know, balances in those line items, particularly in the business office um, support line and the technology support lines. Um, you know, at, I think at this point in the year, through through December, which is the end of the second quarter, I think we're in solid financial standing. I think the next third quarter, particularly around what happens with any uh, snow snow costs and and and, uh, and maintenance and utility costs, will will tell us a lot where we're going to be as we get into the final quarter. But I think we're in good <coughs> good, good position. Any any questions? I think these food service results are getting a little ho hum, actually. They're yeah, I know. It's been, I've been every, a lot. Every time. Have, which is mean, which has been good. Yeah, yeah no, it's great. great. And oh, my only my only other joke, and you know, I'm always <laughs> always bring the joke, is maybe we need to start charging a bathroom fee to build a reserve fund for the membranes and the. Uh, yeah. the I know. I, don't know, I know. I'm just thinking outside the box. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think. <laughs> I mean, you don't think we're going to be on the school committee that you're going to be, you know, having money taken away for uh, the for the wastewater treatment. Yeah, it wasn't. They, they didn't. From, they didn't uh, you know, or the. Wasn't, 
wasn't an issue there. I was really excited to be yeah. with us. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the superintendent loves managing that as yeah, well. Exactly. So, yep. um, thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, Dr. Daly, no staffing at this time? None at this time. Okay, and bids and donations. <coughs> Big numbers in the bids and donations. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses from September to December from the LD Batchelder Parent Organization totaling $7,149.45. I second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee votes to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses from September to December uh, from the J. Turner Hood Elementary School Parents Association, totaling $4,504.71. I second. Any discussion? All those I have what? a quick question. Um, just out of curiosity, did they give you any indication as to what the technology equipment was? Because if I remember correctly, they had donated X amount of funds towards Chromebooks or iPads um, in the last couple of months. So I didn't know if that was double duty or if there was something smaller tech that they were um, doing. I believe, and I, I'll look this up as because uh, I do have it noted on the on the spreadsheet. But I, I do say I want to say it went towards the ma makerspace materials okay. technology in in that lab, the makerspace lab. Okay, just um, curious. Yeah, <laughs> they really do like the makerspace over the hood school. They yes. that. Sure. Okay. Do I. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee votes to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses from September to December from the E. Ethel Little Elementary School Parents Association, totaling $5,041.07. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations from the above list of school activities and expenses from September to December from the Middle School Parents Association, totaling $9,259.96. Seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And I move that the school committee votes to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses for September to December from the High School Parents Association, totaling $2,000. Second. Any discussion? I assume that was the speaker that uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Yeah. Unanimous. Nice work. Intermission. Right yeah. Um, Intermission. Very yeah. good PTOs. Yes. Well done. Well done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Part two. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $200 from Temple Fuel to be used towards the football program at the high school. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude $1,000 from the North Reading High School Hornet Hall of Fame Association <laughs> to be used by each school to purchase new fitness equipment, as noted above, for their participation in this year's Thanksgiving Day turkey trot race. I second. And for discussion, I think I'm supposed to point out that the little school won again, which is why they had the higher amount. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee votes to accept with gratitude $500 from the North Reading High School Hornet Hall of Fame Association to be used to benefit North Reading High School Maskers Band Program for their participation in this year's Thanksgiving Day Turkey Trot Race. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with <coughs> gratitude a donation of $5,000 from Nicole and Adam Griffith to be used towards the at the principal's discretion at the middle school. I second. Okay, discussion on this one. Um, yes. Might this be a good opportunity to invite That's them? That's what I was just yeah. going to say. If they want to come in to shake our hands. Well, we can certainly reach out to them. Okay. Absolutely. Can we look into the feasibility of a giant check? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We like giant checks here. <laughs> I think it's, this is extremely uh, it's very generous. generous. It really is. I just want to know what the principal's discretion is at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. One, two, three, four. Uh, oh, there's hot, five of hot us. Tubs. Look at that. Hot tubs. Right. Out. Just right. But uh, it's a wonderful gesture from, from uh, people of the community to support yep. the schools. I mean, just to remind people, the PTOs are 501c3, so if you want to make donations. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> all, the, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Give me a lot of tax advice. Where my, that's where a lot of my donations go. <laughs> I move. Well, things have changed the last couple of years. So it may not be as valuable <laughs> advice as it used to be. Maybe. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $500 from Arch Painting to be used towards the Future Business Leaders of America Student Activity Club at the high school. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous? I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,620.50 from North Reading High School Lacrosse Boosters to be used towards girls lacrosse at the high school. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $50 from Kathleen Apigian to be used towards Thanksgiving baskets at the Batchelder School. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. And finally, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,000 from the J. Turner Hood Parents Association and Cummings Properties to be used towards sensory programming at the high school. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank Aye. you all. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Do we have our specializations here? You know, Rich and Chris on the donations. <laughs> Janine, this is the one that reads the minutes every week. <laughs> yep. so. OK. Subcommittee update. Evaluation subcommittee met on January 9th. Particularly interested in this one. Yeah, we had the honor of being the first subcommittee meeting with uh, Dr. Daly, uh, Superintendent Daly. So that was a uh, uh, fantastic. Um, basically, we kind of set up uh, a rough timeline for what uh, the superintendent's evaluation will look like uh, over the next several months. Uh, we discussed the idea of using uh, a new pilot system that the state has for uh, as a tool for that evaluation. And, uh, and went into a little bit of detail on, uh, on what some of uh, his goals will look like, but those will be forthcoming. So I think this is probably based on the seminar that I think Rich and Janine and I all attended. And I think the first part of that is proposing a certain number of tasks for the year, correct? If I'm right, I don't know, I'm probably not using right tech, the the goals. Like, yeah, the grid, like you have the goals that are certain, like three or five. And I mean, are we going to, is there a timeline for doing that? I mean, is the goal to try to do an evaluation for this, the rest of this year, and then do a full calendar year, 12 months the next year? Yeah, and I think the goals are going to be more focused. I mean, you can speak more to it. But the goals are going to be more focused for this initial period that ends in. Yeah. in so we're going to do an evaluation on, for on the next. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and that was, yeah. And that, and was that will a, be more focused on the transition, on the, on the transition program you've been working on, right? Yes, so the timeline that we proposed, there, there would be a, a full cycle from now until July. Get, then I would get back on a cycle of one year is from July to July, and that would kind of get me with my other peers that are in my first year cohort. Um, and you know, when, when you're here more than 90 days, you do need to report scores to the state, so th that would make sense, because we'd be reporting in July, and I want to be able to have an evaluation that would be done. So it's a little bit of a, you know, a, a timeline there. We, we, kind of looked at a calendar where there was a formative assessment uh, mid-year around April or, or maybe a little bit in May um, because we want to be conscious of the, the budget heavy meetings in April um, but we do want to do that in public in, uh, in maybe early May we'll say uh, so I took some suggestions back from them and I'll kind of propose I would propose my goals at an upcoming meeting um, e either the next meeting or maybe the meeting right after have all my goals laid out along with sort of this basic timeline <coughs> Okay. Um, as well and so you know a lot of those goals are based on the basics of um, my proposed goals are going to be based on being a new superintendent you know and so part of uh, being a part of the new superintendent's induction program and also with the DESE guidelines um, they, they suggest one of the goals being a part of that program is a goal in and of itself and then all the steps that go along with that um, creating my entry plan and all the steps that are that are going along with the entry plan are part of the goal so as I'm here to update on my entry plan I'll also be meeting some of my goals. So it, it seemed to make a lot of sense uh, to the subcommittee, I thought. Um, yeah. and, and so I, I would, I believe my next step then would be to propose those goals and sort of that timeline together in a public session. Yes, and and truncating, uh, given that this is Dr. Daly's idea, uh, truncating a year-long evaluation into the, the next six months really creates this opportunity, as Dr. Daly said, to, to line up his goals with 
getting into the position and 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 starting to kind of set things up long term. So it it, it marries quite well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can we have a report on the CIPC? Ms. Bell, Mr. Connolly. Um, the, the school department presented our requests at the January 6th last last Monday evening's meeting, um, and. Um, I thought it went, went very, you know, pretty well. The presentation was well, well received. Uh, Dr. Daly and Dr. Downs were in attendance uh, with me when we presented, and um, you know, we, we, we focused on the technology requests as the top priority, and, and but then definitely stressed the the facility and the and the and the needs from our facility requests as well. As you may recall, we we kind of focused on five five requests for next year, um, and you know that process is just. You know, getting started really. We're just under hearing all the departments are coming in and, and, and presenting. Um, there was a there was a meeting this evening which uh, I actually wasn't able to attend. But I know I know Diana Diana was there, um, but we'll we'll continue. That committee will continue to hear departmental presentations this month and beginning of next month, and we won't really get into ranking those until the beginning of March. So it's it's, it's early on. Okay. The only thing worth noting is when we talked about the little school paving again, mm -hmm. he said that Barberry Road was not on the right. horizon That's for so. like the large okay. paving, paving initiative. So that would be kind of scaled yeah. down a little bit. So I don't know if it will be the desire of the committee to try to align those projects. I know it's been talked about in the past, but we'll see. You know, hopefully, hopefully we'll get it done. This year. Mm -hmm. I have my personal opinion, but I will keep that to myself <laughs> <Right>. for now. <laughs> Okay, finance planning team. Ms. Imbriano, do you want to update? Gosh, it was so long. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, you know we what? said we said goodbye to Mr. Bernard. Yeah. And, um, they were the select board and finance committee, and in particular, in particular, the finance director for the town, uh, Liz, was very kind to go get. Some yeah, donuts and, and yeah, Canes, canes donuts, donuts and yeah. sandwiches yeah. for right. Mr. Bernard. Boy, I wish I'd been invited for <laughs> yeah. Yes. I don't know. Is there room on the good. <coughs> we right, saw this yeah. yeah. The the one the one thing I will yeah. say is that we did have the first presentation of numbers for next year and as always I think it'll be a tight budget. Um I think we you know, we have a good working dynamic there. Um I mean trying to figure out it, it's always hard when you have a lot of needs and not enough funds to do fund all those. But I think the purpose of the finance planning team is to have all the leaders come together and really try to assess, you know, who, what needs are most, you know, most necessary. And so started that discussion just very preliminarily. And so, you know, ho let's just hope the fine, let's, let's just hope the preliminary numbers are not the numbers that we end up getting because well, they it would are not be always great. very, very <laughs> conservative in the beginning. Correct. So, uh, and, and so now that all of this talk, it's it's coming through. We had a discussion about the starting point <coughs> from last year because of the fluid, the way that we <coughs> kind of revamped or that. Um, and I thought it was, although it wasn't what some people thought, I thought it was a good starting point. Mm -hmm. um, it, it made sense. In, in, uh, yeah, I may not have been in complete agreement with everything that was said <laughs> at the meeting. So, but uh, no, she's <coughs> they're very conservative. So even I think it, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Always um, positive. Okay, and the budget and finance subcommittee met today before the meeting, mm -hmm. and so I don't know, if Diana. Yeah, sure. Talk about um, no, we just spoke briefly about some work that has been done around energy efficiency, both in solar options <coughs> as well as LED, um, and some work that Michael's putting together for potential proposal to sort of circulate in that and discuss preliminarily with some town representat representatives. Um, and then we didn't have a lot of time to spare at the end, but we started to look a little bit at the budget, but we got cut off to make sure we were here on time. So I think we'll look at that coming in the, the next meeting. Yeah, and I mean, I would just reiterate, I think I think Michael has been doing a lot of work behind the scenes and I, I'm extremely excited. I mean, I, I would say of all the things that I've seen in the last almost three years on this committee, it's probably the one thing that excites me the most. 
about just because it's new, it's different. And I mean, we've had times before we've talked about how can we get LED you know, lights in every building. And I think Mr. Connolly might have a way in which we can do a combined project with both solar and LED where you know where the one helps the other and so like it, i mean the the idea of this combined project where it would take very little funds up front and pay back in in just a few years would be wonderful and so if this can come to fruition i think it'll be a no-brainer <clears throat> for everybody and so i i hope that it works so thank you for all that work thank you thank you what happens thank you and um, then i can borrow your expertise from my house <laughs> yeah <laughs> right <Yep. laughs> Um, Chairman, if I may, um, we also had a uh, policy subcommittee meeting on December. That 12th, didn't make the cut this week. I'm What's sorry. That? that didn't make the cut this week. I apologize. Well, I just, just want, want to make sure we, we uh, had our, what will probably be the last one for uh, 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 at least uh, several months uh, because uh, Mr. Bernard achieved his goal of getting through the entire manual. Uh, so I just we just wanted to give you that quick update. So we had no changes from that meeting. Okay. So I don't think mm -hmm. I think we're done with. Uh, Are there any outstanding from previous meetings that haven't been brought before? I think we're I think we're caught up. Unless we had a did we have a, a first reading? I, have to go, I guess I should look yeah, at the yeah, meeting. We have the minutes from last time, but I don't I don't uh, recall the last I believe meeting. We were caught up, but I can double yeah. check. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Too, but. Well, thank you. Um, okay, sub subcommittee schedule. Some substance Abuse Coalition meets January 15th at 10 a.m. at the North Reading Police Station. NORCAM Board of Directors meets January 23rd at 7 p.m. at the NORCAM office. Finance Planning Team meets January 31st at 8.15 a.m. at the Superintendent's Conference Room. Athletic Subcommittee February 26th, 12.30 p.m. at the Superintendent's Conference Room. And the Fine Arts Subcommittee February 26th at 2.30 p.m. at the Superintendent's Conference Room. For an administrative report, Dr. Daly, do you have anything for us? I do. I just want to pass this along. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. So again, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm enjoying my first uh, few days here on the job actually and I think I gave away all my copies <laughs> there we go um, the first thing that I have is the annual um, the administrative report for the NEC and the SEAM collaborative executive directors reports so I have copies of the the annual report for SEAM that I will pass uh, around here for <coughs> folks to see and then as also uh, one copy this is for the NEC consortium and also uh, what goes to our, our chairs here so I'm going to just pass right. those around. These are for the two um, collaborations that we're part of. Can I can I ask one question? Yes. The <clears throat> sorry to do really right away, but um, is Mr. Bernard the appointed representative to anything that we have to do uh, yeah. that we should do a new appointment? Because I think we've appointed him as our representative to certain committees. So do we? Maybe at the next meeting we can appoint yeah, you officially. officially yep. No, so I don't. I don't know if yeah. you have the list of those, but um, if you could. This is definitely one of them. Those are, those are just one, one big set. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, that looks like more. Um, yes. Um, one of the committees recently we approved, and that was the one in December, and then you beyond. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that if there's anything that we have to officially appoint, that we will double done check that, so. all that. So thank you very much. Um, sorry to interrupt. No, great. Any questions? About just a little it's just confusion. one packet. Um, but there's only one the copy. The NEC one is one large. Um, yeah. yeah. This uh, so this just comes out. I believe that's just a packet there for the. Uh, it seems to be unique from all of the others yeah. with only one yes. copy of it. Yes. OK. We have what we need. All right. I thought I would note that we had a, a visit today um, from our associate commissioner from the Department of Education um, came to visit the school and together we, uh, he and I toured the middle and high school campus. We were able to visit many classrooms and visit with students and teachers. We saw some wonderful, um, some of the same uh, things we saw tonight actually was great. We saw Mr. Ledoux's class outside doing some physics experiments. It was a ninth grade class. Uh, we got down to the TV studio. We saw 
Um, our uh, STEM, um, it, sort of, it sort of took on a STEM theme. It wasn't really intended that way, but that's just how it, it sort of took place. Um, we saw our, uh, our construction design class with the, with the high school class, the theater design class, which is a great example of really, you know, that real world stakes STEM project in action. Mm -hmm. um, we popped up to an English class. We saw our, our RISE program. Um, and so it was, it was just a great opportunity um, to get around and see the schools and he was very impressed with what he saw and had a lot of great things to say about the teaching and learning going on in North Reading. Um, it was also nice to give a tour of the building. It's been a little while since I've done that. I felt like I did so many up front and it was, you know, just to take him in and show him this space even was, uh, was really impressive. So that um, was a very informal visit. It wasn't uh, anything there. It was more, uh, this is a person that, that knows me wanted to come and wish me well and we kind of walked around and saw the building but it was a great opportunity um, to do so. The next item is just uh, an update on the report card delivery at the North Reading Middle School. For, for quite some time we've been doing our progress reports through electronic digital channels um, and many schools in, in the area have done all of their communication report cards and everything through a secure portal, login portal. Um, the middle school is, is ready and prepared to disseminate their report cards digitally through the parent portal. So this is the first time that the report cards themselves will be sent home this way, but we think that uh, both parents and uh, teachers and administrators are very excited about this opportunity. It's, a, it's a, in many ways a more secure channel than, than the previous sort of sending them home with students um, in, in backpacks. Uh, we think that uh, with our one-to-one -one initiative, with our Chromebooks, I was speaking with Principal O'Connell about this. We feel that students are conditioned to routinely check plus portals to see their grades, to see their averages, to communicate that way, and it makes sense for it to come full circle and, and to see their final uh, report cards that way. It's more efficient. It's uh, you know environmentally friendly, less paper, and really the direction that we're trying to to move in here. And so um, I did support that idea, and I think that's. Um, Pretty exciting uh, development there at the middle school. For anyone that uh, has any issues and needs to have a hard copy or something printed, we have all the um, appropriate steps there. And, sh and she has taken many steps to communicate with parents and will continue to do so about this change and, and about this uh, the, pro the proper way to log in. But we feel that parents are already conditioned to be routinely <coughs> checking for grades and assignments, progress reports, and now this is sort of the next logical step. And I, I do think that as this, uh, if, if this proves to be a success, we may look at this in other areas as well because um, we've really been shifting since before I was here even to some of these portals and some of this communication. So it, it makes sense now to do, uh, to do others this way as well. As an update on the assistant superintendent position, um, I've shared and communicated with the uh, staff, the faculty, the, the administration, also with the parents of the community. I, I posted on our website, which then anyone who subscribed gets that email as well. Um, it was picked up, it was in the transcript also um, about uh, the, the letter that I wrote to the community. Um, and so just to update on the assistant superintendent position, the plan there is to my former position is to post that job in the spring, um, but at this time we have different administrators who are um, taking some of the, the, the work and we've divided up into some stipends that are associated with the position. Uh, but a decision that I made and, and that we discussed was that you know, I really wanted some folks that were interested to get a sense of the whole. And so Mr. Colleen, um, in addition to Ms. O'Connell and, and Dr. Downs, are, are doing some of the work, but Mr. Clean will be doing uh, a majority of duties. He'll, he'll also be doing a lot of the responsibilities where he needs to go out um, and, and get information and bring it back and help share that with us. He's been very good at communicating also with the Bachelor School. We have a great plan in place there because he's going to maintain those duties, spend some time up at the central office, but also um, continue to be visible and, and completely accessible. We've worked it all out. Uh, technologically, I mean, he, physically he's pretty close to his school, but I think technologically all his voicemails, emails, everything forwarded when he is here, and he's, he's very responsive, and he's very, um, as always, very concerned with making sure that, you know, he's still accessible no matter what role he's in, whatever hat he's wearing that day. And uh, it's been great. We've had a few meetings with central office um, to discuss some of the changes, and, um, and it's, it's been great. So I'm, I'm keeping the office that I'm in. Um, that's one thing. So if you're looking for me, you would still come into the central office, check in at the front desk, but I was now in the back office, uh, so it was a little different office space than where, where Superintendent Bernard was. 
Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I welcome anyone to, to visit and to, and to come by and, and to, to meet on any issues that they may have. The EF Little School Blue Ribbon Ceremony, as we know, we're very excited about that ceremony, which is on Monday, January 27th at 9.30 a.m. We're going to have uh, some great speakers there, and uh, we're mm -hmm. very excited to be celebrating the, uh, the Blue Ribbon Award, <coughs> a very prestigious award for the Little School. The, the next item that I have on this list is the, uh, the Charles Jones, I'm just going to skip to the Charles Jones Award, which is um, the Charles Jones Excellence in Education Award will also be awarded on Monday, January 27th. That ceremony is at the high school. We're going to try for around 11.45 a.m. And um, Mr. Bernard had sent out a nice uh, memo to the whole school community that recipient, Mr. Votto, um, is being recognized for the first uh, Charles Jones Award. Do you have any desire to have guests there? Because I have to take the day off for the little school and the negotiation and everything else. Is that open to the public or not? There, there are some. If, if you're interested in attending, you can you can uh, connect with me and I can okay. try to arrange that. It's sort of a smaller I didn't know what it was scale saying. presentation, okay. um, but we, we can certainly have you there, Mr. Buckley. Um, we have some, um, some arrangements. It's just a small ceremony out in the main street sort of during the school day for the, for the ceremony. I know that uh, I believe Mr. Bernard will be here as well, and uh, Claudia Brown, who is um, presenting the award and has worked on this, will be there. There will be a few other friends and family, Mr. Jones there, <coughs> Mr. Votto, and, and some others there um, as well. So you're more than welcome to attend. Anyone that would, yeah, would like to attend, put it absolutely. In my calendar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the last item that I had on this list is the cybersecurity grant. I don't believe this has been shared with you yet. It's a grant program, and I just want to clarify that there's no money coming into the school system, which was uh, Michael's first question to me was, you know, mm -hmm. what, what lines do I need to open up? Um, it's a grant in terms of we're not paying anything for what we're going to receive. So they're covering the cost of this. This is from the uh, governor's office. I shared a, a statement for you there. But I think, as, as we know, cybersecurity is, is um, not only a technological um, awareness that we need, but it's also a real, a real safety issue. And I think some of the things that we read about in the news, and uh, just last night I was reading about a school in Texas, I think, that had a you know, ransomware. They took over the school. They hold all the documents hostage, and it can, it can really be quite a situation. So this program is from the governor's office, and it involves um, modules, um, starting with basic safety, understanding phishing scams, password protection. Um, and so there's a series of modules that our school staff will participate in. There are also um, <coughs> drills where they will get some sample um, uh, phishing type emails that they will have to um, interact with appropriately. So if they click on it and it uh, has, the, if, if they should not have clicked on it, it'll come up with like a big oops, you know, and it'll give them s sort of a lesson learned. Had this been a real um, phishing email, these are the things that could have happened. And we'll sort of direct folks to some other modules from there. Uh, the way we're going to design this, we're going to make sure that it's all done on uh, time that's contractual time. I've spoken with both of our unions because that was a concern I had because this project from the time we applied for the grant to where it is now has sort of grown in scope. Um, and so it, everything they're doing is, is great. They've really enhanced it in a lot of ways, but we want to make sure that it's not exhaustive for folks. So there's a certain amount that will be required that we will give some time, possibly professional development or at faculty meetings, things like that. Um, but then we'll have some other incentives for folks to opt in for the entire program. But all of our school staff will be um, involved in the drill. So they will all receive emails and all they have to do is respond to it as they typically would. When they see an email, they should be ignoring it, not clicking on it, not, not entertaining it. Um, there are some reports that we'll receive as a district that we'll be able to analyze you know, how many folks interacted with the email, how many did it correctly, and some advice for us and some steps for us to take. So I think in a, in a, in a world where there's constant threats of, um, you know, ransomware, phishing attacks, um, you know, that, that we're concerned of, I think it's, it's great for us. We're definitely <coughs> going to require this for certain members, and we're going to talk to those members, some of our technology staff, digital learning team, I think certainly the business office. You know, we've had, um, we're well aware of things that happened in the past year with, uh, you know, emails coming to, to business offices <coughs> asking to redirect people's pay stubs to other places. And, and Michael and I are aware of a few districts that um, may have done that by mistake. And, and those are pretty serious things that, um, you know, didn't exist a few years ago. And now they're pretty prominent. So we think it's an exciting program. We're glad to be a part of it. And uh, this really starts 
slowly. They've, they've, they've listened to us a lot with the feedback, so they're going to do a few modules every month, and it's spread out from now until about December. So, um, On that note, you did, yeah. you did request um, that I send you my Social Security number, right? Yeah, that was okay. me. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And so uh, I believe that are all, those are all of my updates. Perfect. And correspondence? I think there's any at this yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, future business. The next meeting is going to be hosted at the Batchelder School. Yes. Um, 6.30 p.m. on January 27th. On February 10th at 6.30 p.m. we have our meeting back here. So if there's no other topics, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. Seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much, everyone.